What's going on, everybody? This is AJ with the Blue Green Podcast. This episode, I sit down with an organic regenerative farmer out of Santan Valley, Arizona. The gentleman's name is Mr. Mark Rhine, and he owns Rogue Rhino Farms. Again, he's organic, he's regenerative, he's doing it from the ground up. He's made a lot of mistakes to get to where he is at now. And we talk about what he is doing now to feed the people, grow amazing food and how easy it is that you know the, the entire population can do it and we talk about nutritional density regarding organic non-organic living soil hydroponics aquaponics all kinds of fun stuff um, and many other things so do me a favor if you like what i'm doing you like what you hear please like comment and subscribe do all that stuff for the youtube uh, algorithm as it helps me but more importantly it helps get mark's message out there about how we need to take control of our food system. We need to take control of our own health and we need to be able to grow, be producers, not consumers, his words. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoy this one. Take care. All right, he threw some things out of the car, right? We're right there. He's throwing some things out the passenger side. They're along the, uh, the wall, the slow lane wall. We're 619, he's throwing uh, Bill out the window. We got Bill the mailbox coming out. 619, I copy Bill. Bill coming out of the window at 2328. Like, obviously, like, this is such an important conversation because, you know, our food's being poisoned. So, but we'll get into all that fun stuff. But, yeah, who are you and what led you down this path? Yeah, okay. Mark Ryan, uh, owner of Riba Farms and Rogue Rhino. Uh, the Rogue Rhino story I'll get into a little bit later with you. But Riba, we started back in 2009. I was a broadband contractor. Worked yeah. for the phone company for okay. 14 years. Um, my business partner and I sold uh, the business sort of right around 2009, right around the crash. Um, we did very, very well with the phone company. Okay. Um, had 85 employees, offices in five states. Um, it was it was a rock. And then uh, there was a lot of trouble within the phone company at that time. It was named Quest. Oh, okay. Quest. The president of Quest got arrested and. Uh, I think he got prosecuted and put in jail for like 10 years. And we started hearing through all of the rumors um, that they were going to go up for sale. And that's when the CenturyLink deal was coming in. As subcontractors to the phone company, we knew we were going to we were going to get the boot. So we decided to that and another reason for we had a problem in our Omaha office on a discrimination case with the EEOC, which was something we'd never experienced before. But one thing I really learned valuable about the contracting business was the work wasn't that hard. It was managing 85 people. <laughs> okay. I mean, it was crazy, crazy. We had 67 trucks on the road every day. Payroll was 225000 every two weeks. And that was pretty much my job was sales and making sure contracts and money. My business partner, who I had started the business in my house, um, five or six or nine years prior to that um, and then brought him on board. He was the technical guy. Gotcha. He was, he was all, he was, he was a brain. I loved our relationship. It was a strong friendship. He took care of all of the technical stuff and I did all the money side. So, and slowly built it with the phone company. The contracts with the phone company were kind of a blessing too. We actually were able to play a role in, in creating the contracts so it would cover us. Even when we moved, made the move from Arizona to Denver, which was where the phone company was, that was their home base, um, we were able to borrow money against our receivables so that we could open the Denver office, um, which was really, not, I mean, it's, it's hard to buy, you know, 12 trucks. Right, right. Set up a lease, you know, bring in, you know, 25 guys. The cash flow just wasn't there. And then, so we did the same thing with them. We went to Omaha, we went to Salt Lake City, uh, Des Moines, and our Omaha office um, had some trouble with uh, as an uh, office gal and their manager on a, on a discriminate, a sexual discrimination type of case. And we then started. My partner and I started talking. You know, this is way out of our league. Gotcha. We, we don't know what we're doing. We actually we had to hire an EEOC attorney. Uh, she was suing us for $110,000, and um, apparently uh, we found this out afterwards. We were the third company she had done this to. Okay. So she really had it down well, and I had hired a 
for an office manager here in Phoenix, an old battle axe. I loved her to death. <laughs> uh, every every employee in that place feared this lady, and she was just a no, just a no shit. You just, I loved it. So, you know, she was like the enforcer when it came to employee policies. Okay. We did really heavy drug testing. Um, the men that we hired were 20 year olds had other things on their mind other than their job. Right. I think we were all that age at one point in time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's when we instilled the drug policy. We lost like a hundred, hundred kids our first year. And it was shocking. It was shocked. I, I was stunned. Um, and it wasn't too pot. It was mostly you know, you know, crank and all the other amphetamines. Yeah, and meth. We and meth. We had a. Um, it was called the ten panel. Was our drug test, mm -hmm. which is real common in the DOT or Department of Transportation. And our particular one even had a cleaner on it. So if you tested positive for the cleaner. Um, you could also, we, we fired you too. So wow. we had pretty stringent third party and it really helped us tremendously with our contract with the phone company that we had these types of, of, uh, policies in place to make sure that, and also our insurance company that, you know, get a bunch of kids driving around our trucks. Right. We had crashes and people getting hit and, you know, the accident thing was all part of it. But once we caught wind of. Also, the e economy crash. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember about 2009. Oh, yes. Um, so our workload was going way down. So we decided to put put the business up for sale. Um, and I was. it took me a year to get it sold. We actually hired a, con or a, a business sales company. Um, they got a really nice fat check out of the deal. Um, three separate people uh, made offers to us. And we finally made a deal with the last couple. They are uh, very wealthy and out of Cleveland. We were living up in uh, Scottsdale or Cave Creek or something. And they bought the whole shebang, one big wax. And nice. we went from 85 employees on a Friday to six on a Saturday. I had We had purchased real estate in uh, Chandler. We had a commercial building there. And uh, we also purchased a house, which I was living and working out of, um, out of foreclosure over in Gilbert. We sold, or when we bought that, we bought it out of foreclosure, and the uh, the temple hadn't been built yet. Mm, okay. And when the new temple went in, um, the property values just went through the rough. <laughs> you know, we were within a mile of the temple. Okay. So everybody wanted to be close to the temple. Um, <clears throat> and that's where I started one of the farms. We started the first farm actually at the building in Chandler. It was an aquaponics farm. And it was really a blast. We built a farm on pavement. And at that time, it was I was really into this. For me, it was more of a health move. I was, it was, I'm always, I've always been a big guy, but I was way out of shape. Okay. Drinking way too much. And I was flying out of town. I was out of town three weeks out of every month, going to all the other offices, keeping an eye on everything. So I was living, eating horrible, mm -hmm. drinking way, way, way too much, overweight, just lots and lots of pressure. Corporate America. Corporate America. So I convinced my partner to build a greenhouse at our in our uh, Chandler, at the Chandler building, and I started growing wheatgrass. I got really into okay. wheatgrass. Wheatgrass was my, that yeah, was my beginner drug into the good food world. Gotcha. <laughs> so, which I dearly love. I'm still drinking it today. Quickly, we found out that there was, you know, a huge need for local wheatgrass in here in the valley and very few people grew out because of the weather so we got to, and then we got approached by a distributor and we started growing wheatgrass for whole foods interesting within like four or five months of setting the dump thing up so we went to you know five or six flats a week for me on a greenhouse to like 40 flats wow for whole foods so we started that's when we decided to start the other company and see what was going on both of us are, we, I like to see stuff to understand how it works mm -hmm. with my, my old business partner. He could figure it out in his head, but I had, so we went to Northern California, went to wheatgrass farms, uh, learned all about microgreens. And so we got to visit all these other farms and it was a real eye opener for me to see what they were doing, how they did it, how the process worked growing in a greenhouse. Um, we quickly found out in Phoenix 
once it got to 110 degrees, we were pretty much out of business. Okay. So that was what made their road with the with the distributor a little bit more bumpy because we had to actually shut down. Okay. We went as far as putting, it started out to be a $15,000 greenhouse and it was quickly a $45,000 <laughs> greenhouse with all the fans and air conditioning and everything that we had to put in it, shade covers and and. So that didn't go too well until the following fall, and then we could rock and roll again and grow microgreens and everything out of that. And then with the aquaponic system, we actually went to Hawaii and got trained there. Wow, cool. And I was thinking, you know, we were going to go play on the beach and then go have a couple hours of training. But it was the training there was, it was a 40 hour week. Oh, it was cool. Pretty much a work week. Um, and then. We were selling lettuce was really our number one goal to get into. And then I went and visited later on, a, a few years later, we read, we visited a, um, a lettuce farm down in Yuma. I think it was called Three Brothers, something like that. But There's a huge lettuce farms down in Yuma still. It's the whole world yeah. gets their lettuce out of And I found out, you know, and I we're doing everything by hand. And our lettuce, I couldn't make the numbers work at under... You know, dollar fifty, dollar seventy-five a pound, and they're doing their lettuce for like eight cents a pound. Oh, just because of volume. Yeah, it was. We, we followed. We actually went out into one of the fields, and there was an eight-person tractor affair. It was really cool, and it was a picking machine, and they did forty-five thousand pounds in three hours. <laughs> You're not gonna touch that. <laughs> it's like, hmm, okay. <laughs> What, so now, I, now I'm seeing why we have such a problem with this lettuce. Right. And then, of course, weather was very, very dominant, and we were on pavement. So I could never make that jump in the aquaponic system. I could never make the numbers work. Okay. For, for scalability, yeah. for a Labor, livelihood. Yeah. yeah, we just, because I had to charge so much for the food. And then we got, then when we bought the ranch house, I built a little farm. It was a two-acre place out there. And I built a bigger aquaponic system out there, which is even my ex-partner was getting very, very upset with the way I was just barrel. I'm a builder. Gotcha. I'm always building things. I'm not a talker. I want to build it and then figure it out and make it work. Um, he finally decided that this was, he's not going to invest anymore. We lost money. All, all uh, He was with it for about four years, maybe. We lost tons of the money we made off of the sale. Gotcha. So he decided he, you know, we were, he's not going to do this anymore. So I ended up buying him out. We also owned the house together. The business did part of the real estate and the building. So we had to go through a business divorce basically. Mm -hmm. And it was okay for a while. And then it got chippy. And so, um, we finally got that done. And then I, now I'm off running solo, but I had to move out of the house that I was figuring on staying in for till I retired. And in fact, you know, the more I think about looking back, which a lot of people do, I could have retired right. instead of done the farm. And would have been still today, would have been very well off. Um, it's just, I just had this passion to grow. And once we got into meeting the people and selling food to the people, learning about cancer and uh, what nutrient density is, the ranch house um, was the property in Gilbert. I had the opportunity to grow aquaponically, which was a water-grown fish system. Gotcha. And soil. And the soil outperformed the aquaponic system. Okay. 10 to 1 in nutrients, uh, 10 to 1 in, in expense. Really? Because I had everything done. You know, we had electricity for the pumps. We okay. had to keep the fish alive. So when it gets cold in the winter, the fish all die, and we were doing tilapia. I and what helped me with the numbers in the beginning was the we could you get two harvests out of the same gallon of water. I get to harvest the fish and sell the fish, and I get to harvest the uh, the vegetables okay. and sell the vegetables. And it's a recirculating system, so very low. There's so again, it's a perfect desert system. Okay. Other than the expense of the electricity. Gotcha. So I invested another $14,000 into solar and converted the whole system over into solar, which saved me $1,000 a month on my power bill. That's a lot. That's a huge amount of money. Um, and that was the old solar system. So, but what I had to do is I had to 
lower stocking density for the fish where at one time, you know, we could have 5,000 fish. Wow. But when we went to, uh, when I went to solar, the fish would poison themselves because we weren't filtering the water quick enough in the solar system because it turned off every night. Oh, oh interesting. I didn't do okay. the battery backup or anything. So, uh, which taught me, you know, the whole uh, stocking density, um, st that really got my wheels turning. So if I lower the stocking density of my fish, I could still perform the growing of the vegetables at much less power. But then when I went to harvest the fish, there's no the state wouldn't let me harvest my own fish. You have to have a certified clean kitchen to harvest fish for, for resale. And I found one guy in Peoria that would do it, but he had a minimum of, it was like 5,000 pounds. Okay. Of, he gets to keep the guts and all the fun stuff, and I just get fillets, and it was a buck fifty a pound, and I didn't have that kind of quantities or anything. So now the fish thing becomes irrelevant. Yeah, you can't I, do anything with it. I've got no cash flow. All I'm doing is feeding the fish, yeah. and that is what's you know fertilizing those plants, and then those plants would clean up the water for the fish. So, and then I'm looking at the soil right next to it. We're just rocking it. Prices are so much less expensive. And then I started doing tissue testing. Found out with the complaints from the restaurants that we were selling to that the aquaponic leafy greens were only lasting four or five days. Really? Where the soil leafy greens were getting out there in the 10 and 14 day time period. Okay. And then there was no uh, nutrients. We, you know, we had tons of inputs going into the aquaponic system. You still had to be very, very careful not to kill your fish with fertilizer. Okay. Um, so we were all organic, we stayed organic. And then when, under the tissue testing, the uh, soil barn, um, lettuce was, it was much, much better. Really? And so much cheaper. So then I got away from tilapia. I went to catfish, played the catfish game for a while. Um, they, as soon as we got a really bad rainstorm, we had, we had what was called pond flip, or if you change the pH of the water too drastically, um, and also we had algae issues in our outdoor tanks. They're okay. big, giant outdoor tanks. And uh, algae will grow great in the day, expel oxygen. At night, it all dies on a 24-hour cycle. The CO2 builds up, and it's CO2 sits on the bottom of the pond, or the okay. bottom of the, these giant tanks. It'd kill all the fish. Interesting. Get a really bad rainstorm on a monsoon, kill all the fish. That sounds like just hell <laughs> dealing with fish. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> all right. You know, how much more money am I going to lose right. before I kick myself in the ass and say, we got to make a change. So at the very end of the system, um, this is before, obviously, before I moved, I actually went to Koi, um, bought the Koi out of Texas. Um, the, just the little fingerlings for a buck. Grew, raised them for about a year, sold them for 10. Okay. At least that paid for the food. <laughs> and I sold them to pond people. That was not food. It was This is all for people that are growing Koi. They want them all pretty colors, right. and so I'm was, not eating koi. Yeah, it's mm. it's a, a goldfish is very difficult to. It's real bony, and even the tilapia, to be honest with you, was horrible um, because I didn't. I was such a. I was very naive in learning the system. Um, I didn't realize you had to run the tilapia through a clean water tanks to get all the shit out of them. Okay. Um, and they just tasted horrible. Gotcha. After we, I mean, we killed a bunch. My dogs wouldn't even eat them. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's where the, and then the tilapia were, were a big issue. So, um, then we decided to sell the ranch house and I didn't want to leave all the stuff there. So I pulled it all out and I still, and then I had the other system from the building, pulled it all out. And, you know, and then it's, I'm moving. Now I got to move again. And, and I hate moving. I, everybody hates moving. Right. But I had jumped, I'd had a house, you know, I'd been in it for 10 years and I went into the ranch house. I was in it for about four or five years. And then I lost that deal. And I really loved that place other than the scorpions. <laughs> um, Welcome to Arizona. Yeah. And then uh, I searched for more properties, but by this time I'd, a lot of my uh, funds from the sale had been gone. I ran out of money, just straight up ran out of dough. Um, so I'd had my my choice of new uh, property purchase was going to be very limited. And I was 
looking out off of Arizona Farms Road. Um, found some places out there that looked pretty good that I could afford, but I couldn't do get my organic status because of the overhead spraying. Oh, from the the local farms in the area, right? Okay. Yeah, they have a ten mile buffer. <clears throat> okay. For all of that, for the organic piece, and and at this time now, I had secured an Albertsons contract. Albertson Safeway was buying our product, so and we took it out of the greenhouse because I had to have a year round product. Brought it into a warehouse, and now we've we've even modified that again which you've seen out at the mm -hmm. um out at the other farm where it's an indoor grow and that's that way i can grow and they were doing 200 cases a week it became my steady eddie my income gotcha. flow. so i had to downsize the industry or the business to the the cash flow so which was me and three other people basically gotcha. and then do the vegetables and then we went to the farmers markets and slowly build that whole thing up so you know, or my, my first go around at the contract in 2000 is when I started my the broadband business. Um, we, we got that up and running very well in, in less than five years. Now the farm has taken me 15 years wow. to a point where we are now where we are making money. You know, I can, I can hire other people. I can expand. Um, we can do it. We've just built up a great momentum. And now I'm looking at food contracts being sold all the way into next year. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it's a whole different ball game. It's just taken so long and it was so painful to get here. <laughs> and I and I lost. So and you know, you you get I got depressed because I wasn't making it wasn't working. And it was always trying to fix, trying to figure out the process, make it happen. And then education, educating all the people that were buying from us why our food was different. You know, even doing tissue testing, nutrient density. And then I had the cancer patients or the cancer crew that followed, started following my farm because they need nutrient dense. Yes. Everything you get from our farm has been harvested the day before. Nothing they could ever accomplish in a grocery store. We are organic, so we're, we're certified. Um, the microgreen side is. So we're herbicide and pesticide free, which is huge in today's world. And it just... The, the these guys bought and they were the, my steady eddies every weekend they were there you know and i got so sick and tired of doing the farmers markets okay they really burned me out and you know it's every saturday you're doing something and during the summertime where you're up at 3 30 you're packing trucks you get to go to the market unload so you know it's a thousand pounds of this and that was another thing i learned too was if you want to make a thousand dollars at a farmer's market, you got to take a thousand dollars worth of product. Gotcha. Or more. And which now think that through if you're selling lettuce. That's How much a lot lettuce? of lettuce. <laughs> if you're at even if you're at a dollar fifty a pound on the yeah. high side, that's still a thousand pounds of lettuce. Well, yeah. yeah. Solids <laughs> and so we expanded obviously our our thinking of variety at the markets. And how I, I did started the markets, we started in downtown Phoenix, was every customer that came through, I would count how many customers came through, how much money I had at the till, and we were at like 5 to $7 a customer. Okay. So if, we saw, if I saw 200 customers that day, I kind of could figure out where my till would be. Um, and so I expanded. We started doing different stuff, the, not just the wheatgrass, the microgreens. Then I started getting into the soil crops and tree crops and everything else with carrots and beets and whatever the season was going to allow. So now we're at like $22 a customer. So <laughs> you, I recently met you within the last year and I've been to your farm many, many times now. And it is just amazing to walk onto your property and see it, you. It's gorgeous. It feels like Hawaii. Yeah, it's, thank you. It's beautiful. It's be, I mean, in the dead of summer, I remember why. By the way, I had a spine surgery in June, and the first place I wanted to go was your farm. <laughs> I did. That was the first place I left the house to go. And I was two weeks post-surgery. I don't know if, if – yeah, I came down there and had my back brace on and everything. But it just felt so nice to just yeah. go there and be there. But it, it, it's – the variety of stuff that you have is just amazing. Yeah, and, and that was part of the maturity of, of being a farmer, I think. Um, is intention and you know I, and I read you read 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 and 
even when we're sowing or, or we're planting with intention, you bring an energy. There's so much more to our, our, our symbiotic relationship with the, with the earth and where it's not just a commercial go out there and right. chop and sell and chop and sell. And once you, you know, you make the, that switch or that maturing process where everything you're doing is with good intention. Your food grows better. You grew food goes faster. I mean, you're still going to have everything breaking in the world. You're still going to have bugs. You know, the bug the bug world is it, the interview. Always, what do you do to spray? And it's we don't. We share. <laughs> Same thing with birds. Okay, we, we really don't. I, we tried netting. You know, we killed thousands of birds with netting. Okay, and so we just share. You know, pay attention. You've got to. I call it the farmer's shadow. You've got to be in your stuff. You've got to be in the soil. You've got to be playing. You've got to be working with it, learning now. And I talk about it all the time. It's not the plant that we're, it's the soil. It's the living soil that's underneath us. Even uh, getting into grounding. Are you familiar with the term of grounding? I'm, I'm familiar with the term, just getting out there and touching the, the right, earth. Right. Yeah. Why we are so, why it works so well for humans. Um, and that is just part of the intention. You know, you're not not shoot, don't have your shoes on, and, st- and then finding what kind of seed, learning how all about seed, how it works. You got to have good seed to get started, and you get into why so many foods are not nutrient dense any longer, and to follow the FDA and and those guys, you know, and looking at uh, ingredient packages and their the data that's on there is 15 to 20 years old, and this the land has changed since then by just pure humans and pollution. Yeah. So we don't have that beautiful soil. And you know, what, and what I've really figured out about growing in the desert, you know, I'm from Oregon, and I've always wanted to go back to Oregon, but okay. I could never afford it because it's so expensive to live up there. But I, I wouldn't know how to grow in the rain. I was going to say, you, you chose don't. the state with the least right. friendly climate to grow in. But here's the other, look at the bright side of it. I have 300 days of sunshine. Yeah. The soil we have here is not that bad in reality. Okay. It's mineral dense. Okay. It doesn't have organic material, but it's mineral dense and it's been baked by the sun. So it's concrete. Okay. So you got to break up the concrete, mix in the organic, pull those minerals out of the soil. And what are you going to do that with? Roots. Okay. Roots of your plants. But really our biggest part, I mean, we have... We get scared because we have a two-week freeze. Right, right. You know, that's it. That's our chill time. <laughs> you know, wherever we are else in the country, they're down for three months, 90 days, where they can't grow anything. I've got friends that live in cold climate, and I send them pictures of my driveway and say, I can't shovel sunshine. Uh-uh, I'm good to all. go here. So once you accomplish or get that in your head and what you learn to grow, and I've always said that we, part of our success is we grow weird food. Okay. We don't grow commodity crops. That's me and lettuce. I'm back to the lettuce story. Gotcha. They're paying eight cents a pound, you know, and I'm paying three dollars a pound just to grow the dang stuff. And that's why they can grow thousands and they support almost the entire world. And uh down in Yuma and mm-hmm. over in California, at least all of uh the United States, but plenty of it gets exported too. But that's not all organic. They've got their own issues down there with fighting water, groundwater. Groundwater is a real problem here, too. Uh, but I don't personally think to small farmers in my area, there's different stages of farming. I'm considered the the small or the ultra small because I'm under 30 acres. Okay. So um, for me, it's not water. It's planting and zoning is my biggest enemy. It's the county and the state. What, they'll, what they will and what they won't let me do. They don't want to let me run a business out of the house. That's what they call it. I said, no, it's a farm. Okay. So no, it's a business. No, it's a farm. <laughs> so depending on who you're talking to, right. if it's a trucker, you know, well, I'm delivering to a residence that's $50 more. Or even the, the power company, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, you're running a business, so you're going to pay more money for your power. No, it's a farm. It's a farm. I mean, it is a farm. Go, go there. It's a farm. Yeah. Agriculture is now agriculture. They're not farms anymore. 
Is so, that for because of taxes? And, taxes. Mm. It's all taxes. Oh, so it's the government getting in the way. Yeah, mm. for sure. Mm-hmm. And food safety, another another huge political football mm-hmm. that it, in my mind is a crime. Um, and what uh, taught me a lot, even though I fight the food safety piece because of my size and then all, and even the organic, uh, many, many people don't understand how the organic system works. It, to me, it's a tax because if I make $100,000, I'm charged 5% to be organic just to use the sticker. If I make $300,000 a year, I'm charged 8%. If I make five hundred thousand dollars a year selling whatever, just to use that label, you know they go it goes up to eleven and twelve, and it's a tax to do it right. I don't. I've always. I don't understand why these food companies. I understand mass production. I understand we got to feed people. I understand that, but at the same time, though, why should we add poisons to food to feed people that are not nutrient dense? When again, organic is clearly the better nutrients, better everything that. Sure. Like, I, I just don't understand that. Yeah. And the biggest crime is half of it's thrown away. Yeah. Whether it's organic or, or commercial. So, you know, the chemical, it's always about for those guys, it's yield, yield, yield. So they want to get so much yield out of that ground and, and that's back to money. And the farmer, even the big farmers that are and they get stuck in the GMO cycle. And Um, I've had several farmers that are trying to convince me that the GMO cycle is a good one. Um, It's very necessary for certain products. I still am not there yet. I haven't seen a corn or a soy that, um, but I don't grow millions of pounds of it. Right. So, because I'm a little guy. Right. And that's why, you know, I can't compete in the corn business, although we do grow a blue Hopi corn. Um, It's it's an Arizona Sonoran corn. And it's not really that good for eating, like sweet corn, okay, but it's really great for drying and making food out of. Okay, and there's a, a mold on it called hulacoche, which is a, a very popular in the Hispanic. Uh, just they love pickling it and eating it. Okay, we get really good money for it. So, um, and that's part of the growing weird food. You gotta, especially during the heat of the summer, you're growing you know, Malabar, which is a summer spinach, um, Moringa, which is a very healthy tree. You're leaning all of what the rest of the world is eating that we could grow here in the desert because of our 300 days of sunshine right. and the blistering heat. You know, water definitely, if the more organic material you have in your water or, or in your in soil will help you hold water. So it just doesn't run off like a the bottom of a clay pot. Okay. You know, when at the ranch house where my old garden, we were at about a 10 or a 12 inch cover there in certain gardens, which was beautiful. I mean, that was some really nice growing areas here um, at this place where I'm at. I've only been there now about five years. We're still fighting a four or five inch cover um, it, because the wind the wind blows it away. You're talking about topsoil. That's yeah, like, the compost. Okay. Compost, compost, compost. The one thing that <clears throat> I noticed about your place, and again, I've, I've been to farms, you know, the industrial type places when you go on field trips and stuff like that in school, there's always an odor and a smell. And when you walk onto your place, first of all, the ground is spongy. You walk in, it's like, it's very, that's, very. That's the compost. And it there's no smell. Yeah. It just smells good. And that's the, that's the fungal, because I do grow what's called a fungal dominated compost. So you can go either way, you go bacteria dominated or fungal dominated. Okay. And since we grow the mushrooms already, the indoor mushrooms, um, which was another, just one of those things I looked at, you know, I think I'd like to try that. Okay. And I was way down at the college at U of A. I was working with the aquaponics. They actually had an aquaponics program down there that really got my wheels turning. And they had grads and uh, that kind of went away. And then the guy next door was a, uh, he was actually a mycologist and wanted to know if I could sell mushrooms retail. Okay. And they're into research. And I said, yeah, I sell mushrooms in the desert? Shit, yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. And so... Um, they were doing packing bags. He had his research going on. And so, you know, we became the mushroom guys nice. also. And that another add to the markets to the and the uh, the restaurants. And, you know, now we're looking, people want, you know, 100 pounds of mushrooms a week, which is a whole nother system, a whole nother sector of, ma- of labor, materials, okay. 
um, utilities, you know, buying all of everything it needs you need to make mushrooms or grow. Um, but we've always done very well with the mushrooms, and we aren't a thirty-five dollar a pound mushroom growers. We're fifteen and eighteen dollar a pound growers. Okay. We're a blue collar grower. Uh, most of the other guys that are our competition out there, uh, they have to charge those higher prices because of the expense of the systems and depending on how they're financially backed. And they're all starting. I always look at that and. They're starting where I was 10, 12 years gotcha. ago because they got a single product. Okay. They have just the mushrooms. They have just the mushrooms. And there's been a, a push. I'm sure you're aware of this, like within probably the last five to 10 years of mushrooms for health. You know, everybody's talking like these superfood creamers from your coffee sure, and mushroom sure. coffee. And it's like, seems like every all the rage right now is and people are starting to understand the the mental benefits and the, the regarding the, the sheathing on the nerves and all those different things that mushrooms can benefit the human body. In. Right. And there were two two big centers of mushroom growing in the United States, Pennsylvania and then the California growers. Okay. Um, now China is number one. Mm. We import all, almost all Chinese mushrooms now. I'm going to guess it's probably not organic. <laughs> yeah. So I'm back to playing the local game. Gotcha. You know, there's strength in being local. Yes. I mean, huge strength. So I, certainly I can't grow the quality or the quantities, but the quality is, is, is there. It's, it's huge. It's beautiful. The benefits are right there. Bar none. Yeah. You're, you're levels above everybody else. Yeah. It, so, and that's what you have to, when you're seeing people or educating people on why are they paying? Like I can argue all day with a lady about an $8 dozen of chicken eggs because of the organic food and what the costs are. But she's thinking Walmart eggs right. at three dollars, and that's expensive. And the box still says it's free range, and, right. you know. And then when you really look into the egg industry, you know, the f free range means they have a little door. They never go outside, but they have a door that they can see through. And, Interesting. And the whole laws around chicken eggs are completely—they're very, very strict. Um, and that's from again politics getting back into state laws. Here we have a, a large chicken grower. Hickman's. Uh, Hickman, the grandfather, uh, he pretty much wrote all the state rules for raising eggs. And they have a, you have, we have a, they, uh, it's called the nest run. You, there's a license to have chickens. Really? Yeah. It's it just at your house or at a, at a farm? At, if you're going to resell. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're all back to resell. So gotcha. It's called, there's a nest run license, which is a, actually a free license, but you're registered. You're, okay. you're on the radar but you're restricted to 750 dozen eggs. After that, then you have to pay for the license. Okay. You actually have people that come and inspect your coops. Um, they then they will weigh, you gotta have, I mean, you gotta make sure you have no cracked eggs. All your sizing has to be right. Your packaging has to be perfect. You can't sell a, you know, a double, a, a small egg in a double egg container. Okay. So, and you have to have them sterilized with a certain sterilizer, which is why we have to refrigerate our eggs here, um, where they don't refrigerate eggs in Europe. I, I we didn't used to. Yeah, it's all with the sterilization. What it does is that there's a bloom on the egg that protects that egg. There's nine thousand pores in a chicken egg, um, and that protect that chick. So, chicken where they lay their eggs. It's not really the cleanest environment. There's, right. There's a lot of poop in there. Right. And it's pretty much a one-way system so that egg can breathe, and that's how the chick will live. But once we wash that, it's gone. Okay. So anything can penetrate that egg, and you can get really sick from it. Okay. Um, also, the chicken egg, uh, they, you a lot of people have allergies to them now. And they were using egg whites as a carrier right. in the vaccines. Right. So back to that game again, um, why the body, you, as a child, you know, you, the body sees the vaccine as a poison, and that's when you build up your immune system against that poison, whatever the vaccine might be used for. But as the carrier agent, which is the whites of the egg, um, it also sees that as the, the uh, as a poison. Interesting. And that's why kids can't, or a lot of adults can't eat chicken eggs. But they can eat duck eggs. Okay. Is that wild or what? That's int I never, that's, this is news to me. That, yeah. that makes total sense. And chick and ducks are not considered poultry. Okay. So you could grow ducks and sell duck eggs all day long. 
So the, it's the, considered a waterfowl. Okay. So there's no real big state deal on duck eggs. Because nobody thinks about it. Nobody. Yeah. When's the last time you went to a grocery store and you saw duck eggs for sale? God forbid some government official hears this and says, ah, <laughs> oh, we're going to get a new law about duck eggs. Yeah. Uh, so all the duck eggs that we sell are all from allergy folks that they are, they're so in love that they can eat an egg. Right. Does and, it taste the same? I don't think I've ever had yeah, a duck They're egg. a little gamier. Okay. I would say yeah, I, I eat lots and lots of eggs. Um, and I, and I hard boil, I almost always hard boil my eggs. Okay. It's, it's my, my, my lunch. Uh, hard boiled, you can't tell the difference. Um, but if you're going to cook them in an omelet or a quiche or something like that, people love to bake with them. Because they're so big and frothy, the okay. egg is so much bigger, um, and the ducks will lay just about the same amount of eggs as a chicken. Okay. Uh, so here, livelihood of a chicken in the desert is about four years. Okay. And then she either gets coyoted or she dies of the heat. Chickens can handle winter way better than they can handle. Oh, heat. interesting. Okay. So, and ducks are. They're pretty much the same. You've got to have a certain breed that will handle the heat. I will always have wanted to get get into the chicken world and breed a good Arizona chicken. Interesting. That would be a layer, a meat, uh, also a meat bird that can handle the heat because they don't really have to worry about the the cold. And where chickens, you know, people think chickens are really stupid, and they aren't. They actually they slow down their laying process in the winter. They, they do it by light. Because they don't want to raise chicks in the winter. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they'll have a much... We're all about propagation. Yeah. All species, even all the way down to bacteria, is all about propagation. And they get it. You know, they're going to have a lot less... They're going to have a lot more death if they do it in the winter. But and that's why they lay less in the winter and they grow, they lay more in the spring. But after a couple of years, the the chicken can't lay as many eggs. It's an egg a day, pretty much. Okay. That's how it does it. And turkeys... Which I and I love turkey eggs, but they lay a lot less okay. of the eggs. Um, so it's you know, so I was back to the story and look, look first the egg <laughs> of the chicken. Um, and I love we the reason why we started the the rogue rhino the, the buying club was so that I was able to share um, our meat. Um, otherwise, I can't share our meat. I can't sell our meat in a private buyers club. We can because it's a it's not a resale op- set setup. Because you're it's, a member. Yeah, you're a member gotcha. of a private club. Gotcha. I know uh, there's a pig farmer here that's been doing it for 10 years. Okay. And, and because cows and pigs and, and chickens, whoops, have that um, slaughterhouse rules mm-hmm. and everything they have to do. So uh, for cleanliness, then we're back to the food safety game. But with a private membership club, it's considered a you know a custom gut, custom harvest. It's just like if you and I went hunting and... You know, we, we shot our deer. We can't, legally, you can't sell your deer meat. Right. Yeah, same thing. And, and, and there's a lot of places it's really hard to even find somebody to clean it for you. Okay. You've got to go pretty much out of Maricopa County. Yeah. For sure to have somebody clean it for you, unless you're good enough to do it yourself. So, um, and that's how we, you know, it's how we were raised. I was raised by my grandparents. I was always thinking, one thing I really got stuck in my head is that every home should be a unit of production, not a unit of consumption. And we've been so brainwashed that to go spend a day in your house, if you add up what it costs for your power, your mortgage, your taxes, you know, what did you spend a day? A uh, lot. Yeah, $80 a day. Yeah, yeah. To keep a house, uh, just to keep the house. Yeah. So why not earn money out of that? That's a, that's a really good con- thought process. Yeah. So, yeah, it, but of course, they don't want you to earn money no, of out course of your not. home because then they can't tax that. Right. So, even you, you're earning out of your home mm-hmm. with this deal right mm-hmm. here. So, trying to. You're trying to. Yeah. It's, it's all about, you know, trying to balance those bills against your earnings. And I don't care if you're going to sew, you're going to make quilts, right. you're going to lay chicken eggs, or you're going to grow tomatoes. So, and for me, the whole food thing, Hell, why don't you do zucchini? You do tomatoes. You because we don't have the land, but all of us in in our community, we grow down something different, and we barter. Yeah, we trade. Obviously, I can't trade lettuce for the power bill, right? But I can certainly trade food for my mechanics to get my my trucks fixed and my tractors fixed, and you know we're all big time bartering 
you know, what ha- food has value, has huge value. Yeah. So why not trade if you can't save yourself a buck? I think there's been a huge shift ever since the the start of the pandemic. Yeah, that people are starting to to wake up a little bit and realize they need to start growing their own food. What's well, the first time they ever saw empty shelves in a grocery store? Unless you've been to a foreign country like Mexico, and so I mean, you can go to a grocery store there and there'd be a lot of empty shelves. But here, I'd never seen that no. in the United States ever, ever. And if you remember, AJ, it was not the produce department. No, that was empty. No, it was, it was the silly shit. Yep. Like toilet paper. Yep. <laughs> I mean, what? So, I mean, the brainwashing and, and how we've been raised and the power of media and the cell phone and all of that game that we play and the radiation that we're getting poisoned with from from that, um, which also affects our food. But I always wonder, how come we still got limes? We still got tomato? Right. And, you know, and then another thing, too, that I think what opened up a lot of people's eyes with the pandemic was we're starting to realize that how much the government has been bullshitting us. And uh, there's still people who will not, will disagree with that. Uh, I agree. I, I agree with you completely. And, you know, and I've lost friends over that and even family members that were just so, psh, 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 yeah, it's, we can agree to disagree on right. this one, but come on, let's be logical. The, the, the older I've gotten, I'm in my early forties now. I've had a couple of health things happen and it has just come like, your health, I don't give a flying F about my car. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. Like, you have to have stuff that works. But, like, my most important thing to me is my health now. Yeah. I'm extremely conscious about the food. And also, I, as I told you before, I have two special needs children. That The allergies and the food allergies. Right. And, Where did all that come from? Right. And the gluten intolerance. And how come when I feed him this, he turns into a maniac? And then, you know, it's the moderation of the diet and all that stuff. Like, when it comes to special needs, like, for parent, and I apologize for going off on a tangent here, but, like, on for the parents of special needs children, they need to get their diet in check immediately. Yep. That's the first thing you got to get in check. And again, I'm not sitting here claiming to be perfect in right. any way, shape, or form. I'm just yeah. saying the on a grand scale, trying to do better, eat cleaner, eat less less produced, not uh, less um, what sort preserved? of preserved, less preservatives, like nitrates yes. and stuff like that, yes. which are they put in meats to preserve them. Yes. And, yeah, all of that. It, it's just yeah. And why why isn't there uh, gluten allergies in Europe? Right. Because they do it the right way and they don't have GMO. Yeah, same in Russia. Any of that in crap. Russia, of all places. I know. Glyphosate's illegal. All that stuff's illegal. They won't. It's what happened to the corn. I mean, Mexico used to have, I think it was like 106 or 116 different varieties of corn. Okay. Now we're down to like four. Just they've all been killed off. Yeah, all been killed off. And then the GMOs with, you know, Bayer and Monsanto and all that good stuff making the, the glyphosate, but then it killed everything. But then they changed the corn so that it can survive the glyphosate. And then now, you know, you're feeding chemicals and bullshit to people. Yeah. No nutritional value whatsoever. Yeah. It's frustrating. Very frustrating. And, and that's part of, I think, when I went through my depression era, era fighting the farm, because there certainly is much easier ways to make money. <laughs> than what you did yeah, yes absolutely much much easier you know going back to the technical world satellites and you know bringing oprah into people's houses i mean the pay was much much better the labor was much easier yeah um all of that but you know this it just stuck with me it became the passion instead of profit and i and i love where i'm at now because i feel so good getting out of bed, even though I'm making a lot of noises now getting out of bed because I'm so damn sore <laughs> from the day before. But um, it's just a great feeling to feed people. And you know you're doing it right. Even though I don't have the biggest house anymore, all my cars are, got, are over 150,000 miles on them. They're dirty. <laughs> I used to have the cleanest cars in the world. I mean, it was so important to me. And now it's Great. I think thankful it rained. Right, right. I got my car washed. <laughs> you know, it's like there's so much stuff that I don't need. Yeah. And it's uh and that I think that's part of getting older too. Amen. I'm starting to just I don't need this shit. I'm becoming my dad. <laughs> you know, and I'm getting more and more conservative as the days go on and with the insanity of the political world mm-hmm. and then you can't let that get you down either cuz you still got to get out. You still got to produce. You've, you've got to build. You can't just complain. And you know how cell phones and 
everything else is it's all complain 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 yeah yeah and it's so and for people and i love to do research and try and find other ways to do things um of, of all places like australia the, the the farming that is done in australia is phenomenal really because of the high deserts that those guys yeah. dealt with and all of the chemicals and the way they i mean regenerative agriculture came from pretty much the birthplace of australia interesting so and then the people that are here that are now trying to um to which i really got into the regenerative thing once i started working with the animals um you know when i started i started with chickens and ducks and they couldn't get the gardens because i have to have food turned over every week especially for the markets so i can't just do an acre of squash and have it all get ripe and i've got 4500 pounds of squash okay i can't sell it before it rots okay got no place to put it so we have to grow in, you know in, a, in an order so you know we'll have two rows of this two rows okay. of that so i know the following weeks in 45 to 60 days that i'm going to have enough of this enough of that okay. for what we're doing um and that just takes you know a lot of brain power and a couple of shots of tequila to get creative <laughs> um and think your way through how do i do this how do i plant so that everything and then you throw seasons into it and weather I love it. So, but you got to you got to study. You yeah. have to fill your brain. No part of this it requires intelligence. You got to yeah. think about what you're doing. Yeah, the pro, it's process. Yeah, and that was one thing I loved about the phone company was how not only did they have their processes in place, but they had two or three backup plans. Yeah, yeah, for every process. So if one broke, you had Plan B. Plan B broke, you still had Plan C to get you through. So um and it, it's just that repetitive thinking you go okay how do we do this how do i like you know how do i build how do i live on this soil and leave it better than i got it why is this such a problem in america where i mean there you hear these studies and you know big big podcasters have big people on that talk about like we've only got like you know nine to ten more cycles or 30 to 40 more cycles like why is that the process when again the land has been the land since the beginning of time. There's been a process, but us humans are, are messing with that process right. and screwing it up. Why can't we just get back to that process where we're putting the nutrients and the minerals back into the ground? Greed. Wouldn't these companies fare better if they said, <laughs> let's think a little bit longer term as opposed to billions of dollars now? No, corporate greed. That's greed, greed, greed. And now, you know, that, like I told you in the beginning of our conversation, um, how much beautiful farmland here has turned into houses oh where we live it was for those who don't know we're down in the uh, pinal county yeah and this i moved down in this area 13 years ago in santan valley and it was 80 percent farms and just a couple of housing developments now it's 95 percent houses and all of the farmland is gone and yeah. it, it breaks my heart yeah i mean yeah this was yeah back then this was they were growing onions here they, uh, there's even a table grape that came, but the white fly got the table grape, okay, um, which changed that whole thing. But um, that, a lot of that, and also um, the colleges. With, you know, I was very, very familiar with U of A and working with, them, and that's called the Land Grant College. Are you familiar with that term? I'm not. There's. This was done, I think, back in Woodrow Wilson's days. But every college in every state, there was a land grant college that would teach research all agriculture to help the farmers and those schools got federal funding to do that so and they were supposed to stay local and with all the i mean the challenges like the land grant college for oregon it's oregon state ours is u of a okay. and all of that kind of went away when corporate got into it um like the big berry companies big um, shocker there yeah um you know, Driscoll Berry okay. um, are doing, they're hiring the colleges to do the research for them. But it's still considered third party research and they'll donate four or $5 million to the college because it's so much cheaper to have the kids okay. do the research so that they can, whatever they're trying to develop or do. And even the chemical companies do it, uh, everybody that with the land grant, anything on that, that side, but they've lost sight of the farmer. Gotcha. 
completely lost sight of the farmer. And the yield. farmers are doing... Just big yield. Well, yeah, they're just doing what they're trying to do. I mean, and I love them to death. And they're just, you know, what well, they're trying to do what their grandfather did. You know, they still... And it's, even the dairy farmers today, in today's world, they, they're the only answer to a dairy farmer today is more milk. Okay. That's it. So how do you get them to produce that? The, the, more milk. More, more milk, cows. More, more cows. Land. Yeah, and even if you look at how a dairy co-op is set up, it's it will astound you. Of uh, fifteen different dairies, fifteen different names, and they all go to one place for pasteurization, super pasteurization. Okay, it's all mixed together. Okay, and it comes out in five different brands: Shamrock and this yeah. and that and all that good stuff. It's all the same, it's and the they same. can't even sell to somebody else. It's part of their contract. So once you, you know, food contracts are, are devilish. I mean, they're difficult. So if you've got a farmer that's been doing corn and soy, he's got to get so many bushel, bushels out of that land. And without federal funding, he could never make it. Without being subsidized. Yeah, without being subsidized. Subsidy, far, food subsidies, the food farm bill will totally blow you away. And, you know, there's like five or eight guys here that I know of in Arizona that are receiving huge amounts of money, but nobody knows where they, who they are. It's really? kept confidential. And it's going to addresses that are PO boxes that don't exist. Why? It's just money being granted. Mm. <laughs> yeah. mm. Here we go. So, okay. There's some fuckery going on. It's big fuckery. And I've always wanted to meet a farmer that got subsidized. Okay. Never met one. So where is the money going? Somewhere. Is there local subsidies, state ran subsidies, yes. or is it all far, federal? It's well, they're all. It's all federal. Federal leads to to state. Gotcha. State, and, and you know, and I'm involved with that now with the food banks and that type of thing. The, that is so political. The grants, um, you know, like I wanted to refinance my property so that um, because I bought it at a very good price, and and because of um, you know the crazy land prices now you know it's 150,000 an acre now i'm going to say it because of all the californians moved here yeah. in 2020 cuz we were a free state back then yeah so i can't <laughs> i can't uh, if to get federal funding i can't qualify for a refinance but i qualify for a new part a new a new purchase they want you to rebuy your own land yeah well no i have to go buy another piece oh gotcha 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 so um and because uh you know i'm i'm not i'm uh What's the word I'm looking for? Not disenfranchised, but, you know, I, I don't have a disability. I, I'm a white male. I understood. Mid-60s. What's the word I'm looking for? What do they call it? A majority? Yeah, <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, um, but that's who they're looking to loan the money to, okay. to give the programs to. Uh, like back over in your world with the uh, when the cannabis, yeah. the new cannabis rules. That Social equity. Out. Social equity. Yep. That's the word I'm looking for. Those were the guys that could qualify for those major licenses. For the, the for the new farms and all that stuff. Right. Which I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that. Or even if they'd been busted before, too. Gotcha. That was part of that game also. But again, the cannabis world is a whole nother grow. I, I did it in the industrial hemp, thinking that it was a great idea or um, it's going to be a savior for the big guys that are growing off alpha and cotton. Uh, for the outdoor grow, but the post processing of the business is so toast. I okay. mean, it's just wrong. There's the equipment's not there, the market's not there. There's this huge roadblock into having stuff built with hemp. Why is the road? Everybody knows and agrees and says, "Oh, the hemp oil's the best. The fibers are the best. Everything is the best. It's regenerative. You can grow a you can grow a hemp plant in." A quarter of the time or half the time like it's it's amazing and the volume and the water savings right and, but then you know there's no there's zero equipment that will harvest especially the hemp for building hempcrete to that type of things um because you know the buds all at the top that's a 20 foot tall plant they have a they have crazy names for their stuff a decornicator or they got to take certain parts of the plant apart okay and and they will make that as their material the clothing piece of it, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then 
the cannabis people hate the hemp growers because of the pollination I- issues. So, because they don't care about male and female. Right. Uh, they're not looking. It, the CBD growers are different because they're hunting for that female, that bud. They're hunting for that that big bud and no seed. Um, but and you notice the cannabis rules here, if I'm not mistaken, are still, it's only an indoor grow. And even for the license to apply, it's five thousand dollars. Yeah, are you talking for the cannabis or yeah the, for cannabis? Yeah, for cannabis. Well, the, the licenses um, are a mono, uh, uh, everything's monopolized right now. Yeah, and the licenses have all been taken, and the social li- social equity that happened here in Arizona was an absolute joke. And so now those licenses, you know, say I did win a license, you know, I mean, how many millions of dollars would it take for me to open up? You know, this is where. People like who want to, if you're just a grower, you should be able to get just a grower's license. If you want to just be retail, you should be able to, but that's not the way it is in Arizona. You know, if it's a vertically integrated license. So that $5,000, okay, great. But how many millions of dollars does a person need to start yeah. those companies who don't have it? Yeah. But then these big MSOs come in and they'll say, hey, I'll give you $15 million for that license. Right. I mean, the smart person qualify. would take the money. Yeah, absolutely. And the hemp world is set up similar to that too. There is a separate growers. Um, there is a called a grower. Um, what was the other one? It was for doing transplants. Oh, grower nursery. Okay. Transportation, and then the last one, which was the big one, was called processing. Okay. And they wouldn't allow processing on residential land. They'll only allow it on commercially zoned. And, and it's the sort of thing where it's like. You were supposed to have had all of this stuff lined up before you got your license. And then when you got the license, you're like, well, shit, I didn't have any of that stuff. Yeah. So I, I could have had a great product, but now I got to sell it because I didn't know all of these things. To even qualify for the license, you needed to have a, a commercial property that met all of this criteria. Yeah, and you think you would think that we learned about it because Oregon had the same problem um, when their laws came into play where all these guys had to grow indoors. and. Oregon, Southern, I went to school in Southern Oregon and that Southern Oregon, Northern California, you know, the triangle mm-hmm. up there, mm-hmm. which was the whole reason that when I was going to school in the 70s, when all of that beautiful sensimi and all of that came up in the, in the golden or the green triangle, you know, it came from poisoning in Mexico, okay, which was uh, Paraquat. Are you familiar with that? I'm not. Paraquat is a term. It's another Monsanto bear. It's like an Agent Orange product. Oh. Where we, the CIA, actually flew into the Mexican deserts and sprayed all of those plants with Paraquat. All the, the cannabis plants that they all were growing. The can, everything that they could find with Paraquat. And then as a user, we were in college, we would smoke it. Okay. And it would make your lungs bleed. Okay. So you're actually coughing up blood. So that was their Thanks, Id- CIA. Yeah, that was their idea to Dicks. stop the drug yeah. push in, which and then all it did was force everybody to grow local. Okay. And that's where in Southern Oregon, Northern California, that area is so perfect for it. And everybody grew on BLM land. Nobody grew on their own land. Smart. Yeah. So if they got busted, they just lost their equipment. Um so and that's where then then they really got into crafting the genetics mm-hmm. and it just became stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and what seeds they could and you know they went underground with it even now that it's gone commercial um, the underground is still less expensive and it's a much better product that's but, not deniable <laughs> that's, you, yeah. you can't deny that yeah and and then you know the games with the uh, not the distributors the dispensaries. Mm-hmm. And their lab reports, and mm-hmm. everybody's chasing the THC. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we went to CBD, CBG, C. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. And there is, um, there's a great DVD set, and I don't know if I've shared with this you with this before. It's called. Um, it's actually a church that did it. Um, it's like nine uh, DVDs, and you've got to watch it. It's the most comprehensive medical cannabis dvds okay i've ever watched okay and i love and it's testimonial after testimonial oh what's the name of that you would love that i actually got it, you can't buy them anymore uh, mysteriously they got taken off the interesting market. yeah weird how that happens yeah 
and uh, it's so and they've got patients on there that are you know growing their own um and eating the live the living leaves yeah. they're not looking for the t i mean not looking much for the thc but that symbiotic relationship of thc and cbd um the higher one is it's the same thing like what we do when we're testing for a mineral content in cucumbers or tomatoes um we test for sugar okay the higher the sugar the content the higher the mineral content oh okay. that test is called BRICS, b-r-i-x which was actually created or was established in europe for the grape farmers um for the higher the sugar in the grapes they would know when to pick the grape and it was always under a full moon was this for processing for wine yes oh. wine and champagne gotcha and you can actually do it outside with a little measuring thing that's why if you see any of the old movies you'll see the guy looking yeah. up in the sun through a tube yeah. yeah what he's looking for is the bricks value and they it does it changes the color okay so you know when the right time is to pick your grapes whatever your grapes are and now you can cheat it which the the cannabis guys obviously learn yeah. real quick with uh, sugar products where you can actually feed your plant sugar and it will pick it up and then will, you'll have a high bricks which means you got a high a high count okay um but if you're an honest grower you're a sincere grower for yourself you can see where you stand right it's a very inexpensive test and there have been several people that have developed products where you can take it actually into a grocery store and you can tell the nutrient density of a tomato, a cucumber, right there. At no the kidding. Store. So you know which ones are old, which ones are new, um, you know, and all the tricks. And they said, absolutely no way they're going to let those things come into market for sure. But um, yeah, people would be astonished if they went and did that and saw how crappy their food system is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The nutrient piece of it is just toast. But it's people, again, like, People sit here and bitch and complain about like the fast food costs too much and this or that. Why are you eating that crap in the first place? Yeah. Like I just don't understand that part. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's America. <laughs> yeah, I don't you know if you've traveled outside of you know we're we're I I uh, I was funny. I was watching a Tucker Carlson when he was in Moscow. Mm -hmm. He went to a McDonald's and bought a Big Mac and fries and the whole thing, and and it was really funny to. You know, could it be exactly the same in Moscow that it is in Phoenix, Arizona? <laughs> and he said it was. He should have, when he's eating it, it was in a, he said it was wonderful. He had a cheeseburger, fries, and chocolate cake or something. <laughs> so the fries were perfect. Gotcha. But that's, just think of that corporate. Yeah. I mean, they, McDonald's runs like the potato world in Idaho. They have to have this perfect potato with no eyes. They're also they destroying the ocean with their fish burger. They have to have this perfect. I mean, they take all the scrap fish and to make their fish burger the same, and they have these huge, huge quantities that drive that business. Man, I've I've heard that uh, like the McDonald's potatoes, they like have to douse them with a chemical where yeah. it has to sit for three weeks because it's yeah. poisonous for three weeks. Yeah, that the farmer won't even eat them. <sighs> what? Again, I get the corporate greed thing, but like, my God. It's there's yeah. you're just killing people. Yeah, just killing people. That's that's the reality. The diabetes and the heart, you know, the cardiovascular issues and all that type of stuff. It just it all a lot of it comes down to food. Yeah, very much so. How do we have homeless people who are overweight because the stuff that they're eating is just shit? It's shit. Yeah, they can't get real food down on the streets. <sighs> you know, we do we have a farm box program that we work with and. Part of the challenge was, um, especially for the street people in our boxes, um, which I would have never have thought of. What I, we were asked for ready to eat food only. What do you mean? He says, "Well, the people we're giving this food, they don't have a stove. Right? They don't have pots and pans. Right? They're sitting in a tent. So, can you make this all ready to eat food? Like, yes, you can eat a raw beet. Yeah, you know it's." You can eat turnips without a problem. Onions takes a little bit more of a, of a flavor, but um, so we had to kind of rethink this. Okay, what do we put in here that doesn't need to be cooked? And in food safety people, it's completely the opposite. They want to kill step. They want to, okay. It's called a kill step. So they want to make sure that the food has been killed. The bacteria, listeria, 
E. coli, all of that somewhere has been killed. Um, so they don't want the organic food. They want something with a kill step. Pasteurized, Pasteurized processed bullshit. Homogenized, sterilized, even irradiation, which is a, a, a lighting that will kill. Like the mushroom world, uh, many, many people eat raw mushrooms. And you should never, ever, ever eat a raw mushroom. Okay. Always cook it. Okay. Always cook it. Even the ones you get from your farm that you pick up? Especially mine. Okay. Because it's a living food. Okay. The button mushrooms and the stuff you get at like Salad and Go and those guys, all that's been irradiated. So it's dead. Okay. It's dead. There's nothing, there's nothing in that mushroom. So there's no nutrients? Dead. It's been zapped. And that's how you can get away with eating it raw. Even the, the we do the school foods. Oh my gosh, the school foods are even worse. Yeah. But so like, if you buy a mushroom from us, you can actually take the mushroom, take the spore off of it, and grow mushrooms. Okay. The next day, you can start your own mushrooms because they're living foods. They're still alive. Okay. Even though they've been harvested, but they're still got spore. They still got stuff coming out. Okay. After your radiation and button mushrooms are also a manure base which is another big fear for the E. coli scares. Um, same kind of thinking, AJ, if, you, if um, we go to Mexico and we drink the water, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the enzymes in your stomach might be able to handle the water. Mine won't. And I'll be on the potty for a week, you know, and where you're, you're going crazy, have fun. But, you know, especially people that are, grew up down there, you know, right. they have all that immune enzyme built in their immune system, so it's and that's why the whole food poisoning or the is is such a huge ordeal because of everybody's built a little differently. They grew up differently. They ate different foods, so you can't the the vaccine or it's a shotgun approach to kill. Right. And when you the, a kill step is a shotgun approach. Okay. Which will get rid of nutrients, and if you take a, a tissue test of a, a, a head of lettuce after it's been cut, you do the tissue test at 24 hours, you're gonna get a really nice bold um, panel of the nutrients. Okay. 48 hours, you lose 50%. Okay. 72 hours, you're not gonna get anything in the grocery store that's under a week old. So it's rotted. It's it's depreciating itself there's nothing feeding that plant or that tissue at all and another I, when i had the aquaponics i would do tours at the uh, building i would um we grew our lettuce in these little cups in okay. the water systems and i have two quart jars up in the front and i'd have one with red food coloring in it and one with uh, green food coloring in it um and you actually the plant would pull the food coloring right into the leaves and you can see it. I go, there are no magical filters right. in a plant. It's going to suck up everything. If it's uptaking, you know, it's going to uptake. In, and then now we're systemic. So that's, it's nothing you can wash off of your food. So the only, like, my introduction to really growing anything was when I started getting involved in the cannabis world and just understanding how cannabis grows. Obviously, it's a plant, and all of the vegetables and everything you grow are plants. So there's always this big talk about flush. You know, for for the big growers, when I watch their stuff, and I don't I don't grow cannabis myself. Um, why would you want to put something into your plants that you need to flush out? Well, again, we're back to yields. Okay. Okay. So, and especially if we're pushing a plant to flower, if we're pushing a plant for veg. Uh, you know, if we if you're in the outside world, you know cannabis is photocentric, so there's only certain times of the year you can grow right for it to flower because it's the sun, the time of day. So if you're planting off that schedule, outside, you're going to want to push veg or you're going to want to push the flower. Okay, so you want to push that stuff out of it. If it's, it's but your soil is going to be a big player there too, if they've got alkaline soils they're going to want to they're going to want to flush that there's all kinds of little tricks and tips to doing that to the plant again for higher yields more thc whatever they in most of the good farmers 
will repeat a process if it works. Okay. And if it doesn't work, they'll change. So whatever they've got going on in their heads, it's like when I was doing aquaponics and I was putting tons of inputs into that water. And I learned that the plant, some, a lot of plants didn't take up the inputs at all, you know, because my pH was too high. Okay. So it, the roots it, are plugged. It just, it just can't stop the plant from just, being able to I'm suck it up. I'm just pouring it down the drain. Gotcha. That's all I'm doing. Pouring it down the drain. What? Hydroponic people str struggle with that all the time. Okay. They can only grow so much in that plan, in that their pot or their tray or whatever. They got to flush it. Gotcha. They got to clean it all out, start all over again. Gotcha. Because it's just sitting there and it's not doing anything. So the we're plant like, can't take it. So like soil though, you can add the bacteria, the mycelium, yeah. the 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 um, compost and all that type of stuff. Yeah, and just soils. Yeah, it's a little bit think different. You, there's you can you with the water it's much much more difficult to have a living water than it is to have a living soil living water because it's of the constant flush okay there are living waters for sure anything like artesian wells okay stuff like that it's going to be a mostly a mineral base because it's coming out of the soil even all of our water that we're drinking to in today's world we should have only be drinking from spring water not well water not surface water but only spring water, that's the water that has actually gone down through the filters, okay. picked up the mineral, and then come back up in the spring. Gotcha. But of course, we don't all live around artesian <laughs> <springs>. wells and natural <laughs> springs, so we got to move water around. And we live in Arizona, which is <laughs> yeah. literally means land of little water. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, so, and, you know, you can do, a, there's been some great studies on, on books with, like, ocean water, Completely different world than because of the salts and the minerals. And you can live off of ocean vegetation. Look at what the ocean supports in life. Mm -hmm. That because of that, live, now that's living water, unless we've thrown all of our shit in it. Right. And artesian, the same thing, same kind of thinking. But water in a hydroponic system or like my aquaponic system, it was urine, the fish urine, mm -hmm. or, and they call it the nitrogen cycle. That would just was all we were really growing with was nitrogen. Okay, which is great for veg. So where would you get the nitrogen from? The nitrogen well, we have it in our air. We're okay. breathing it right now. Okay, but that nitrogen is all part of. It comes from the urine of the, the fish. fish. Yeah. So, so I didn't so know this. Nitrites, nitrates. It's a big circle, and it all starts from the waste. So I didn't know this about the non-organic stuff, the stuff that the, whatever, like it's all petrochemical based. Correct. Oil. We're putting oil on our foods to yeah. grow. Yeah. I, that, they discovered that in World War II when they were building bombs. I didn't know that. Yeah. The, how, how much the, uh, and nitrogen is, comes from uh, nitro, or, uh, natural gas. It's a waste product of natural gas, MPG. So that's another thing too. It, it, there's, don't confuse man-made nitrogen, though, with real nitrogen, okay. or the Earth's nitrogen. I mean, lightning storms. You go to Oregon and the, the strawberry fields, and you'll see them just rowed with lightning rods. Really? They're trying to grab nitrogen out of the sky to make their fruit blow up, and they'll fruit much more. There's a new thing now. It's called electric culture that's been around for since the 1800s. Um, but now it's the new buzz. So okay. Part, these little copper, we've got some on our place too. I've been playing with it to see if it does anything. The one thing I did learn about neutroculture is that um, bringing, pulling that power, that energy from the earth, from our atmosphere, the earth has a frequency. Yes. Everything has frequency. So, but you're constantly bombarding your soil. You're killing nutrients in your soil. You're killing the living cooties in your soil by this constant bombarding of electricity that you're pulling out of the atmosphere. And that's a good thing? That's not a good thing. I was going to say, that sounds like no, a bad thing. It's a bad thing. That's why electric culture makes your house plants look great. And all you're doing, you're just pumping nitrogen. Okay, so okay. Even when they went to the space station up, you know, up in space, they're just pumping nitrogen. Why would you want to grow food in space? <laughs> You know, is, is there really a plan B here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we're going to make it that far. Yeah, it's uh but again, that's certain people, certain research, that's their passion, not my passion. Right. So if they want to try and grow lettuce in space, let them give them to Randy, you know, like we're going to 
ever need it, but um, so that's their way of spending money. But that's where the nitrogen piece is super important. It grows veg, grows huge plants. Okay. Monster plant. The the plant tower. Have you seen the plant tower? That guy's made millions no. and millions of dollars. It's oh, a, oh, you're talking about the, the waterfall thing? Yeah, that, it's yeah, an yeah, aeroponic yeah, yeah. system. It's about eight, six, six or eight feet tall. And right. You, I got you. I, I'm yeah, sure yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's all the nitrogen. They have their two patented uh, chemicals. Okay. They call it Tower Tonic A and Tower Tonic B. Tower Tonic A you use in the veg cycle. Okay. Tower Tonic B you use in the flowering cycle. And it's, they call it an aeroponic system. But if you then take that tissue test, that food against soil, it's like dead food. Soil's going to win. Soil's going to win. So the living yeah. soil is the way to go. Always. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's our planet. Yeah. How do you take dirt and make it soil? <laughs> uh, organics. Okay. Yeah. It's going to need wood. Uh, anything of the wood nature. Um, will help it, it, it depends on where you're living if like in oregon washington it's all evergreens so you got super high acids super acidics because that's what's falling off the evergreens okay you know if we go like here we're all alkaline okay it's all salt there's not really too many forests around here <laughs> um because there's nothing there's no acid to offset that and the sun burning it up so ph is the golden rule and where you want to grow now you could still grow in high ph soils and you can grow in, in acidic soils. Okay. It's just the plant that you're going to grow. Gotcha. So then that's why we have such a different diversity in our soils. But if we go to Nebraska, that has the most beautiful, black, gorgeous soil in the world. But if they monocrop the whole place into growing corn and soy, they're all going to draw just what they need, but nothing's getting replaced. Okay. There's no, there's no recycling going on. Even the whole carbon sequestration game, right, right, which is another, to me, is a silly topic, because if it's zero point, here's the question I always had. We have zero. It's point zero four percent carbon right now, in which they say, if we, you know, carbon is life. Okay, we are all carbon. Right, we're carbon beings. What was that? Star Trek. Carbon based life forms. Yeah. Yes. Oh, is that Star Trek or? Star Wars. I think it was Star Trek. <laughs> Whatever it was. Um, the more carbon sequestration we have, you know, a carbon system is a living system. Okay. So we've got it in the sky. We've got it in soil. Now they're saying because of cars and all that we're doing is we're killing or we're, we're increasing the carbon system. Well, we raise carbon. We're going to raise life. It's right. It's going to warm the system. It's going to warm the atmosphere. And then if we sequester carbon, put it back down in the soil, back down in the ocean. Um, but it's points, the point zero four is the number they're working with. Okay, I want you to tell me then, where's the rest of the carbon? Yeah. Where Where is this if coming we're from? we're using it as a 100-point scale, where is the 99.96 right. yeah, yeah. coming from? I have no idea. Where is it? Is it in the trees? Is it is in the water? Is it in? And I mean, if you can't tell me where the other stuff, how do you know that this is going to hurt anything? Right. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong. When we're talking the word carbon, we're talking about carbon dioxide. Yes. Which, or they call it carbon sequestration. Yes. But we're talking about there's, what plants need. Yeah. There's more than one carbon too. So there's going to be a, you're a dioxide, carbon dioxide, monoxide. Yeah. Yeah. There's different forms of it. Okay. Um, that can't be, we do need it. And if you look over the last hundred years of the earth, you know, that we've warmed and cooled and warmed and cooled. And actually we're considering ourselves that we're cooling now. But in my mind, if we just took all the private airplanes, all the jets and grounded them for a year, like they did with when nine 11 happened, right. you know, it was the cleanest skies we've ever had. They also did notice too, that there was research that was done during that period of time. The, the temperature went up. It's the earth everywhere because that the the jet streams and all that were not cut you know was yeah. providing those fake clouds essentially right and the the temperatures went up a little bit so yeah and our military has a lot to play with that too yes when i was um, when i first started in um, the microwave business we were using we uh, shot telephone signal over microwave 12 gig 9 gig 3 gig 
And some of the stuff the military was using, they would actually bounce it off of the atmosphere and burn a hole in the atmosphere, oh, in the nice. ozone to bring it back down. And they did that so that their signal couldn't be detected if we were shooting the, the beam straight across. Gotcha. Um, and of course, you know, when was the last time you saw a, a military jet that had any kind of air pollution control on it? <laughs> you know, yeah, no, they don't care about that. No, the commercial guys though, they've got right. their shit, they got, they got a boot on their neck trying to clean up their, their motors. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a real problem. I think the whole green wave is, uh, is just another political game. I agree with that. To try and knock it, knock us down. I think that we should work on sustainability. We should work on regenerative stuff, but at the same time, like we had a lot of fish to fry right now. Yeah. We're not going to turn off diesel and no. gas and go to electric. It's, I mean, the point is driven and, and I love Elon and what he's trying to do. And, but the electric car world and how much power and right now that they're burning up and all kinds of crazy things are happening with the cars and that, you know, Ford and Chevy really delved into mm -hmm. the EV market mm -hmm. and now they're losing billions. That's you and me that are going to pay to bail them out yep. because they're going to crash. They're going to go down. I mean, Oh no, they're too big to fail though. Don't yeah. worry. Our government will step in and give them billions. Yeah. Whoever it is. I mean, it's just, I would, I always thought, you know, how cool would it be to have a solar tractor? That would be cool. But then you look at the reality of the batteries and everything that would have to go on that tractor yeah. in order to do what a diesel tractor does. Yep. And now tractors are multi-million dollar <laughs> toys now because they're, you know, they're all run by satellites and all kinds of, and they're doing huge, huge plots, but I don't see it you know, in a snowstorm, they're not going to be able to drive through anything. No. But. When the thing is though, too, is that like, again, you're talking about corporate greed and all that good stuff. These corporations have businesses to run. They can't have everything switch over to electric tomorrow and expect to have sustainability. They can't yeah. ex expect to have, you know, to be able to, my, but my question kind of really is also, is that like, do these corporations actually really give a shit about feeding the people at all? Or do they just give a shit about the almighty dollar? Yeah. It's just the almighty dollar. Yeah. Time and time again. Absolutely. There, there's a really neat company. I follow them on, on the social medias and all that good stuff out of Canada called Edison Motors, where they're making diesel electric in-house diesel electric vehicles. And they're talking about why this is a better system to go to than all electric or all diesel. So it's kind of neat to see like different ideas coming about and people trying to solve right. how do we get, you know, make things better make it you know longevity regeneration i that. love that kind of research thinking yeah but once you put politics into it where you, we're gonna you're gonna have only battery operated cars in seven years right stupidity yep utter stupidity even the whole with the hydrogen cars and that i mean i love that that's man and passion and research trying to solve a problem yep that's all they're trying to do but you get the politics into it now it's all about money. So you're trying you're, to run a farm and it's all about politics. Yeah. You're trying to oh, we, very much. We talked a little bit about when I was over there the other day, like y if you put this structure on and that structure on, well, now you got to tax it at this much and that much. It's like, it's my damn property. Yeah. And you're That's trying to why. feed people. And you'll never see a, a planning and zoning ever b go backwards on the, on the zoning. No, you'll never have somebody that's, you know, an R seven get rezoned back to egg. Never happen because you'll, taxes. To less you're going to spend less in taxes and they want the money. Right. Let's, you know, let's not talk about feeding people and health and yeah. And they said they got to have that money for sewer systems and, and the power and all of that. And it, it always amazes me. Okay. It's tax dollars that built our electrical grid yeah. and we're still charged for the electric. And they're private companies now. And now they're private companies. SRP, APS. Oh, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we built the whole thing for them. And then they give you the solar story. You know, here we go. Okay. Yep. And I love solar. Don't get me wrong. I love it on Absolutely. my farm. Absolutely. Um, you know, but I've never been to a mine where it's child labor that's building my panels. I've never seen that part of the industry. I'm feeling what affects me, and that's my power bill. Right. You know, I run you know, thousands of dollars in power bills. And if I can chop that in half, 
I mean, you see some of these guys in Marana, some of those big farmers, they have $40,000 a month power bill. Yeah. And all that's to do is pump water. Yeah, yeah. That's all that does. And then think about that, like, again, back to the cannabis world. Yeah. I, I believe heavily in medicinal cannabis. And those people that are growing with the indoor grows with all the thousands of lights and all that stuff. I Again, I guarantee you didn't get into the farming business to make money. You did it for a passion and wanted to feed people and get people healthy. And you wanted to get yourself healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Why is this so difficult? Why is it so taxed? Why is it so... Why is people's health such an issue for the government? Well, I, it's that circle, uh, you know, who uh, pharmacy, uh, you know, yep. where the the health system is. A, it's a, it's not a health system. It's, you know, it's it's a vicious circle. Lifetime customers. Yep. In pharmaceuticals, Shitty food makes sick people. Sick people need pharmaceuticals to stay alive, and where they're just going to spend that money round and round and round we go, um, you know. And then the power of uh, the farm, big pharma, and big ag. Their power is un, un, way beyond our comprehension. I'm sure. As, as just regular Joes. Far beyond. I mean, the millions and billions of dollars of those guys. And then, you know, so why I think the small farm is going to be the real savior is, you know, because then we're all going to do it community-based. Yeah. And, and you, we're not going to conquer big guys. No. We're not going to conquer any of that. But as a community, we can help each other. Yep. We can make it better for each other. And that's where we share information. And we don't have to rely on the false truths that are being embedded in our brains by media or cell phones and how bad all that shit supposedly is, really. Not really. You know, and the fishing guys, I got friends that fish in Alaska. You know, some of those guys are just getting the shit strangled out of them because of the quotas um, and what they can and can't catch and what really is going on in that ocean floor. Um, and then you get to, like, the Exxon Valdez. Yeah. When was that, 25 years yeah, ago? Yeah, no, 80, late 80s, early 90s. They still haven't paid a buck. Yeah, of course not. Not a buck. Of course not. It's still in court. <laughs> They've and got the money to hire the lawyers to yeah. keep it tied up for years. And the politicians, I mean, they're just not pushing it. So if we're here to get healthy, you know, where do you start? To me, we it's grassroots. Food. And, and it's the only thing we can do um, that we can have an effect. And you know, we can sit and talk and bitch about everything that we've bitched about today. But if you're not doing something, no. making the change, build something, change the process, share with your neighbor. I mean, we don't need to hate each other and no. I you know we don't need it i don't care what your religion is i mean, when i lived in the, the ranch house and i was we were knee deep in you know mormon community mm -hmm. huge mormon community and everybody was fighting but they weren't fighting over you know what they're fighting over water in the trench okay coming down because <laughs> yeah, it runs right through there they're all fighting he's pulled his ports and i had neighbors that would they get together because uh, I, do you know how the irrigation system works? Are you not you specifically? Ports? Oh, I understand how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Concrete trenches. Yes. And everybody gets ports, and you you're charged by your time that you pull out of the trench. And okay. It's, the water level. Well, this one is done under what's called miners' inches, which is inches of depth of the water that's going down the trench. If you're getting your water through SRP, they call it head level, which is a different thing. So. If you're running a vegetable farm like I do and you're running off of irrigation, trench irrigation, you've got to be very, very savvy not to flood your property, especially when you're in, you've just put in your plugs and you got your babies. It's just going to, it's going to wash it all away. It's just gone. And then, and you know, when I moved over here, we were on, uh, it was, it was pretty good. It was like an eight day or a 10 day turn on water. So it was a little bit less than two weeks. Okay. I lived there for, maybe five years, and it was all the way up to 16 days. In 100-degree weather, that turn is a big deal. You need every bit of that. You, yeah, you're not going to get enough because you can only put so much water on your property. Right, right. You can only flood it so much. And I was growing food, and I was at the end of the line, and the, most people are doing it for uh, horses. Okay. They're pasture animals. You know, they're lawn furniture, hay burners. Um, for a vegetable guy, it's a completely different world. But... You have ports, and of course, you know, you're going to pull, and it's all done. 
they release the water on Friday night at six o'clock, and the water turns off at Monday morning at six. Okay. So you're in that schedule somewhere, and it almost always happens at two o'clock in the morning. Gotcha. So who's going to go out and pull their ports at two o'clock in the morning? You're doing it. And close their ports at two at three o'clock in the morning. You know they just they aren't going to do it. They're going to go out, maybe open it, and then go back to bed. And then the guy next down, he's pulling his ports, but now you're both getting the same amount of water, which lowers that level. Okay. So I can't get the full gotcha. flow. Gotcha. Because you're at the end. Uh, or you, anywhere downstream, you're getting a lower flow. Gotcha. Than if he closed his ports and then it fills back up, you got a full 14 inches. As soon as you pull a, a property on it, it will go down to like eight. You put three or four properties that are open, your ports are barely getting any water. Gotcha. So some of these guys, they just leave them open all the time. And I'd had neighbors that would actually get furious over this, and they would go and put concrete Ooh. their ports of the violators. Okay. So that they would really have to start paying attention. They would never get water. And it was it was battles over water, water, water. And then you get, you know, the guy at the, at the it's called the tail water, at the very, very end, um, you know, he'll get people that won't even pull their ports. And so there's a ton of water coming. And they just forgot they were on vacation or whatever. They bought their time, but they don't pull their port. So that trench is full. Gotcha. And it just goes and it will flood his property. Gotcha. He's at the very, very, that's why they have a tail water or a spin water. So you can just pour it all out into the street if okay. you have to. So it doesn't flood your place. Um, that was the challenges with the irrigation over there. But I was always, it, was, it made me giggle because. Yeah, you know, we're such different people, right? And we're arguing over water. Back, back to eighteen hundreds arguments. Yeah, over, <laughs> yeah, over, and it's so that that always. And now I'm on a well, so I'm I'm much better off. Although, you know, my water went this. Uh, I'm on the uh, different system, and they cut it down to geez, I think you only get two runs in the summer months because they lost the CAP water. Okay, which again, back to politics. Yep. This goes all the way back to Goldwater days yep. when they built the big dam up north. Arizona didn't want to play. They didn't put in any money. It's the feds in California. So then they put together some kind of crazy ass law that says once that dam gets below 1,190 feet sea level, below that, Arizona gets no more water. Right. Goes to California. Yeah. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, you know, well, well hey, ooh, ooh, you know, what's going on? And then. Nobody had the forethought of thinking, all oh, that's coming off the Colorado range. Now, and Colorado's been losing that water for 50 years. Now they're thinking it out and they're damming it. Okay. So they're stopping the water okay. before it even gets here to save it for them. Gotcha. And it's oh, the whole insanity of it. And just, yeah. And we just keep building more and more and more and more yeah, and more. Yeah, I was I was really curious, you know, that build that I'm at down there on Ironwood. Um, I lost ten foot um, when they put in that tap that big well gotcha. down on Ironwell. So on Ironwood, and even though I'm at seven hundred feet, the quality of your water, the lower you get, is much much worse. Okay, um, you know, it, it turns into like a milk. Okay, and it's pure salt. You can't can't do anything with it. It's pollution more than anything, and it's, and it's because of the sedative of the uh, of the water of the groundwater that's coming in. So, by them opening up that, and there's supposed to be a law that says every developer has to guarantee water for right. I think it's 100 years. It is 100 years. Yes. Yeah. Where's that coming from? <laughs> so when you talk to these guys, and um, when they were doing the big build out, now that Apache Junction is going to be the largest city in the state are you talking about that new expansion on ironwood well that but they're taking it all the way down okay to uh the shakespeare guys it's called uh, renaissance Fest. yeah it's okay going, that's how far down guys. yeah <laughs> that's how far down they're going jesus and it's all going to be houses and the 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 project managers you know well that's 20 years down the yeah. road we'll figure it out by then no no really we'll figure it out by then no. oh, come on i mean just look at the town that we're in I mean, again, the population has tripled yeah. in the last 10 years. I mean, and again, there's no plan. Well, what the hell are we going to do for water here? Yeah. Where is it going to come from? Well, that keeps seeding the skies, but all that does is hurt us even more. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we had three inches on our place. That's half a year. Do you think that that is part of that 
because of cloud seeding? Oh, it's all cloud seed. It's all California. No shit. All, they, the new atmospheric river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The new term. Yeah. Yeah, that's their shit coming over onto our side. Caused by cloud seeding. Yeah. No shit. And the, now California, they're really stuck. I mean, granted, they were out of water because of poor planning. Yep. But now they're all flooded out. And yep. they've got the big burns that come through and all their, I mean, all of that material that would hold the water in the ground has been washed away. They get the big burn. There's nothing to hold it. And they just keep building and building and building. So, you know, they've got their, now everything's full. Even Shasta is full, completely full. I mean, there's, they're full. Well, they're dumping water. And the CAP had the same thing too. They were dumping water in the West Valley. Okay. But over here, they're restricting it. We can't rechannel that water over to the east side? Or? We, oh, we certainly can, but politics are not going to mm. let that happen. In fact, there's a big water bill right now coming up. And, you know, it's, it's giving more power to the wrong people for the water. Um, you know, and the canal water has done miracles for Arizona. I mean, absolute miracles. Um, but you get down to Yuma Way, where it gets really salty and it's really crummy. Even far west, it's it's really crummy. Okay. It's, I mean, the water's different qualities and the canals are open. So there's a lot of challenges there, like SRP, to keep all of the growth down. They do helicopter spray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in Israel, they actually put solar panels over all their over everything which is a lot better thinking gosh wouldn't that be a good idea <laughs> yeah because they're getting power from both from the oh and the protection um and the sun blockage from the panel and then they run their power wires and everything on their canals because it's all the land is already um the uh, zoning is already yeah. done so they can use it it's just like when sprint um made the deal with the railroads this is back in telecommunications but they were the first a telephone company that had uh coast to coast okay uh lines and they made a deal with the railroad guys because railroads in the olden days the way they do their land zoning it's a checkerboard effect but try and think of one company or one zoning that would go coast to coast maybe interstate maybe interstate but that's it but yeah but the rails and the rails have been around since the 1800s Interesting. So all that zoning. And then when Sprint made the deal, this is what we're going to do. We're going to follow your lines and we're going to put fiber in. Yeah. We're going to go coast to coast and then we'll branch off of each one of that wherever we go. That was good thinking. Was brilliant. Idea. Yeah. And the railroad was really struggling for money. Rail, you know, rail, all of the rail companies are sort of struggling for money, especially if they kick out coal and yeah. some of the big uh, transportation that we need for power. And the coal plants today, from what I understand, are so freaking clean, it's, it's crazy not to burn it. Um, we, think we need the power. And now we'll go back to the 70s when the nuclear plants were real popular. Right. What happened to that? Well, you know, I, I'm being a child of the 80s myself. The nuclear scares. Was huge. Terrifying. I mean, I remember watching the bullshit of Chernobyl on the TV of the, I remember this one particular video and just being, and I mean, I was a little guy, I mean, five, six, seven years old. Right. And that terrified me. And then Three Mile Island and just a few, but even Fukushima, but in 2012 or whatever, there's, it, it is a hard thing mentally to say like, it is clean and we should do it. But at the same time, if something goes wrong, it can kill many, many, many people. So I get, I get the fear of that, but it's zero emissions. It's, we should be doing it. Except for, the accidents. Right. <laughs> right. So how do we balance that out? Is anybody even keeping that kind of data? You know, and I was, I was so, I hated the idea of Fukushima and because all of that was coming over to the West Coast. When right. I was living on the Oregon coast, um, you know, people are checking their salmon for, for radioactivity. And, and, and also being a resident of Portland, there was an old, old nuclear plant up in the Washington, Oregon coast. Okay. Um, or river on the Columbia that's been leaking radio activity for 55 years or something. I mean, and we ate that fish. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're not glowing. We don't have three eyes or, but who knows what kind of cancers we caught off of it and that kind of thing. Well, nobody kept that. I, that's part of the learning process. Obviously we need power. We need energy to continue in a society as it's built right now. Yes. And how do we go energy 
how do we just make a change without electricity? I, and electricity even scares the shit out of me because they, they don't need troops to walk on our land. They just need to turn off our power. Well, that's the big scare right now. Yeah, and that, that's, we're done. We're yeah. done. You're not, I mean, everybody's going to get their guns out. Yep. And they're going to, you know, they're going to feed their neighbors, do what they can. We're not going to be, we're only going to drive or have a bug out bag and go to a woods and live in a cabin. And... I'm going to your place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going we, to your place. We could support a lot. <laughs> um, just bring your guns. Um, but it's true. That's another th reason why I really want to go uh, put a solar, my well pump in. Because uh, we could be without power, but if I can't get that water out of the ground, right. my food's all going to die. Well, and I mean, think about what does the sustainability of a, an American household right now without electricity? M okay, so most people put their food strictly in the refrigerator and probably don't have reserves. So you're talking maybe three days, yeah, maybe five at the most. Yeah. I, I mean, that is like open the refrigerator quick, grabbing something out and shutting it real quick, and making sure the cold air doesn't get out. But yeah, you're yeah. talking no longevity. Nobody's growing their own food as they should be. I mean, again, a hundred years ago, there wasn't a grocery store. If you wanted a fresh vegetable, you had to go in your backyard. You had right. to grow it yourself. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the big scare right now is what's going on in this country regarding the electrical grid and all yeah. the uh, the it's, hackers it's, and all that stuff. It's broken. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The hack because we've computerized. Everything. We've made that, yeah, we centralized all of that, which I can see the benefit, but also... The drawback is, is enormous. Well, that you were you crazy were, hacker in China. Yep, could turn off our nuclear plant. Yep, I mean you worked you worked telecommunications and you know there was fault tolerance and there yeah. was backups and, and like, I did telecommunications too. And again, like, but it does it appears as though we don't have that. Yeah, <laughs> like our government, like private companies have fault tolerance and private companies have backups of backups of backups. But apparently, like the United States government's just living on a prayer. Yeah, we do. They just say we don't, right? So they can avoid uh, the penalties, yeah. of being stupid. They they have it, but God, it's I hope. easier to say, "I'm sorry, this just broke," right? And then you're stuck. I think it's it, there's no guilt. You know, I think it's just all that is just a cover when there should be tons of guilt. But yeah, you're right. Telecommunication. I mean. Turning off your mobile phones, going back to wired phones, should be. We have no idea of what the the radiation poisoning is doing to our our bees, our insects, our critters, our people. What, what do you, you know, say? Satellite to people? pollution is everywhere. I remember I went to a, a a show in Vegas when we were really heavy into it, and they had a a forty foot container tipped on its side, had a big feed horn coming out of it, and they were watching TV off of the container. No kidding. Yeah. That's how much shit was coming out of the sky. No kidding. Yeah. So what do you say to people that, like, the, the older I've gotten and the more I've gotten into sustainability and in my health and all that good stuff, that don't think this shit's real? They don't think that, like, you know what I mean? Like, everything is emitting a, a wireless signal and radiation right. and all that good stuff. I mean, yeah, every, I mean, everything does. The, you know, food even emits a little bit of radiation. But, like, there's people who... Sort of plants. Right. And plants I mean, have a frequency, too. And they just... But people are like, oh, that's just, you know, propaganda. And, you know, the 5G is safe and this is safe and that's safe. It's like, but, but we don't know. Never done any testing. They're, right. Yeah, 5G, they never tested 5G. Right. They just rolled it in, believe the cell tower people, and how we used to build cell towers. Right. And when we would... I worked on the mountaintops with, with the gigahertz stuff. We wore necklaces that had a big tab on them. And we were working in Vegas on one, and we got bloody noses on those towers. You know something is wrong. Right. When you're getting a bloody nose from climbing a tower. Right. I mean, it was uh, the FM... They're coming. I mean, there's 10,000 watt systems, 100,000 watt systems. I mean, FM radio is wildly strong. And we, with the uh, same with the phone companies, the big conical antennas, mm -hmm. if a bird flew through it, they'd dead. No kidding. Burn them up. Because of the microwaves. Yeah. No. They'd have, you know, there's thousands of stories of on the building tops with it. We had 10, 12 foot antennas and. The uh, the workers, the night watchmen would uh, they'd go up on the roof and and eat their meal up okay. there. And when they when you sit in front of the antenna, you it you get warm. Yeah, yeah. And you have no idea that it's cooking you from the inside out, like a little microwave. I haven't had a microwave in my house for twenty five years.
because I worked with them. <laughs> Fuck, I'm not, I'm not going to cook my food with that dumbass thing. So now I have to go throw away microwave. Sorry, yeah, babe. Yeah, yeah. Microwave's got to go. Yeah, Sorry about do, that. Or have fun. Do the plant test. What's that? You microwave the water. Okay. For Do two plants. Do something really easy. Okay. Like a pea, pea plant. Pothos? Yeah. Pothos. Perfect. Same soil, same pot, same everything. That one's tap water. This one is microwave water. Watch them grow. Okay. Just play. Interesting. It's like, wow. Wow. Probably nothing's going to happen to the to the microwave one. Speculation here, hypothesis. <laughs> hypothesis. Well, you're on the Johnson water system here, though, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who knows what you're going to have coming out of your tank? Right. No, but yeah, the microwave one will definitely come out much weirder. Interesting. Yeah, because it's sterilized. It's cooked water. It's it's actually changing the molecular setup, the atoms, all the way down to atoms in the water. It breaks it all to pieces. That's how it heats it. Yeah. It's an atom buster. So, yeah, it's like, you know, and it, yeah, why can't you? Uh, and you think that little box you're protected and guys that have pacemakers can't be around microwaves. You go into any restaurant, you you're know, right. in the kitchens, <laughs> no pacemakers allowed. Why would that be? I never thought about that until <laughs> just now. Yeah, fuck. Because whatever's coming out of that box is going to change the voltage here. We did that in our last tour. I, the plant waves that I had up, where I had the singing plants. I don't know if I've showed that. No, I'd I do love it to in the it tours. Though. Okay, I've got these really cool little boxes. I got into this another rabbit hole that I was playing with was the frequency of plants. And it was a book I read probably 10, 12 years ago, "The Secret Life of Plants," which was just poo pooed and it was just all nonsense. And I mean, it was really rejected in the plant world and. These guys, they were working with chili peppers, and they actually hooked up grown chili pepper plants, put them, hooked them up to a lie detector, and all the plants were on lie detectors. And they, the plants actually have frequencies, okay. so they are they're bumping needles. Yeah. Then they started playing with it. They started cutting one plant. Okay. And the needles. Go, they started putting bugs on it, and they started doing even the pruning of a plant. This one would start jumping. No kidding. And then they got even better, smarter. They started the communication with the roots. So they did four plants in one pot, and they put a, some kind of you know, a bug on one corner on, on the far corner, and there's a communication going through the root system to the plant on the other end, getting those needles to bump. It's just wild, and you know even the earth puts out a frequency. Absolutely, it's, it's eight. I think it's eight meg or you know eight. Hertz. hertz. Yeah, yeah, eight hertz. Um, and then bees emit a frequency, the beehive, and it's called the key of C, or it's middle middle C. So it's from 240 hertz to like 400 hertz. And this is another crazy part of the plant world is that the bee frequency of its wings when it's flying, the plant can tell what it is that's no coming. Shit. Yeah, so... Certain plants won't let certain, like, hummingbirds in. They won't let them in. Even my fig trees, um, it, uh, which is a reverse flower, they all have a little hole, and it's a wasp, that the plant allows the no female kidding. wasps to go in, lay her eggs, have the babies that come back out, and that's what the fruit comes from. Okay. It's great. It's nuts. So, And beehives for guys with PTSD... It's a it's a very calming no shit frequency that will just mellows them mellows you right out, and so we microphoned the beehive to see you know it's it's crazy how it changes in the day and night, but the the wing flapping is what will change the plant allowing the plant in out for more uh, pollen close the stamen, and then we in the tour I have four plants set up. And, you know, we have a frequency, too. Mm -hmm. So I show everybody all the different frequencies of the plants. And what the new company has done is these guys, were, they do it through a phone app. They've assigned each frequency a sound. And it's a piano, a flute, something that we can recognize, that we can hear. Okay. Um, and different plants have different music. And they would get quiet at night. 
and then they roar during the day when no they're kidding. feeling good and when they get fed they change it it's all changing and you can set they actually give you like 25 different uh how should i say it they're different sounds different moods yeah they could be moods some plants are yeah they're more bass some are higher pitched but they play with it a lot like that so uh, when you come on the tour i'll have also i'll have them all singing okay and everybody says, ooh, uh, ooh, and it, they sings right out of your phone. And then you start disconnecting it. And then it's, it quiets down, it quiets down. Then you plug them back in, it quiets up. Um, even mushrooms will do it. Okay. The banana trees were doing it. And then I was doing it with people. And uh, one of the guys on my tour, um, I had them all unplugged, and he had a pacemaker. You should have heard those, that box sing when I plugged him into the pacemaker. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, it just went wild. And I mean, different people have different frequencies. No. I mean, it's all part of our immune system. It's everything that we do. But since he had an electrical okay. pulse, and it was, it was it was wild, it was different. The, the whole frequency thing, there's been a lot of talk recently about like the pyramids in Egypt and all that were, you know, everybody's still baffled on how do they make all this stuff. And now they're starting to lean into the whole, maybe it was like different frequencies that were used to harmonics and all that type of yeah. stuff, and water frequencies. Are you and, a musician at all? I like music, but other than that, no. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a huge theory between, I think that they call it the 484 hertz and the 580 something hertz. It's a different complete channel i mean in the telecommunications world everything's frequency right that's all different levels that's how it, and like fiber it all works with frequency and different light waves on and the same way fm radio am radio all of that is just different frequency but um it was really i've now i forgot where i was going with it musician the, yeah, 480 was, 580 yeah if you look it up and it was like all the old music before recording was before the 1920s was a certain hertz and then they changed it it was and it changed the key of c it moved it okay and uh, piano tuners they know quite a bit about it too so um but i was really so intrigued and now they even like a dog whistle they have and that's 580 you can actually breathe through that to calm yourself you can meditate okay. like blowing through a dog whistle and then you know, what we really can't hear as being a human being. Right. Um, and there's so much going out, else going on out there that we have no idea. Right. No. I mean, look at the different light spectrums. I yeah. mean, everybody's familiar with infrared and x-ray and all that type of stuff. Like there's a there's shit going on through us. Yeah. Right. We're bombarded all yeah. day long. You bet. Yeah. That's so. And all that, the plants are affected by it. And depending on, again, where they're at. Yep. You know, if they're down in the Amazon or if they're up here in the desert or if they're in, in a forest somewhere. Same with fungus, mushrooms that grow underground. Well, and I know that there's been research that's been done in the redwood forests and all that that are that are starting to understand that the mycelium network touches everything. And that, like, if this tree's deficient in nutrients, the trees will actually, like, divert nutrients to another yeah, tree. Move and, sugar around. That's amazing. Same with the bug attacking like the bugs, we've got the big bug problem up north in the pine trees. It's a beetle, and a lot of people don't understand how trees, you know, the, how they kill bugs is they do it with sap. Okay. Because they're, they're, especially the boring plants, they'll sap them down to kill them. Uh, but then if it's on the leaf, it's a lot bigger challenge for them to try and kill. But they're talking to each other, and the biggest living entity on the earth is actually a, a mycelium field in Oregon. It's like 35 miles. They can see it with a satellite. No shit. Yeah, it's all underground. It's pretty freaking wild. <laughs> I love mushrooms, the whole mushroom world. Even following Paul Stemmets. And yeah. now he's got his, with the, we're putting in a new beehive. Uh, one, my, one of my girls is really into bees. So um, we're going to set the hives back up. And um, there's a, a, a mite that the bees are picking up, a varro mite. Um, and they pick it up from all of the other plants. And, in the olden days, before pesticides and herbicides came into play, you know, and the bees, you know, they're collecting their pollen, they bring it back, put it in their honey. Um, but this mite now is, has has picked up, and the bee, and it will kill a beehive. So you actually smoke your hive. Okay. With this, I don't want it. It's not really a. It's like an insecticide, 
to kill the mites so that the beehive will still stay alive. Stemets, what he's figured out in his crazy world is uh, he was in the forest and he was watching the bees in the woods, um, especially the ones in the logs and the, the ones that were underground, were all att attached to a certain mushroom. And the, the mushroom was putting out a liquid um, and so he was real curious to see why the bees were collecting that liquid. Um, and apparently it was to kill a mite. Interesting. So they were protecting themselves. So yeah, yeah, yeah. he's been able to reproduce that. Now he's patenting it and he's come up with this, uh, bee feeder. Seven, so the, I, uh, he was so, I loved, he was so good for the community and, and the world and nature and, He's such a caring guy, um, but he's gonna, he's now they're making a bee feeder. It's a watering feeder that will have the fungus in it. So any bees that were traveling by your house or whatever, be like a hummingbird feeder. Nice. They would go in, drink the water, pick up the uh, the fungus, take it back to the hive to kill the to kill the mites. Nice. He also had another product I thought was phenomenal in clear cutting up in the northwest is a disaster. Okay. A grid back to greed, and it's all BLM land. Um, but he has a fungus that you put in your chainsaw oil. So when you're sawing all the trees, all of the leftover slag get automatically inoculated with a fungus to re to help uh, recover the forest. No kidding. Yeah, isn't that a great idea? That is a great idea. That's, That's you're you're helping along the way. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, did you go to his talk? He was just in town. I did. I did want to go to that, but I just wasn't able to make it. Yeah. It was very intriguing. I, he he didn't get into the cultivar side of it. It was mostly the wild, but okay, incredible. There's another medicinal that has just barely been touched. Be uh, it, we're not even scratching the surface on yeah. it. I mean, even on the psilocybin side regarding mental health and trauma and all yeah. that. And then, like I said, all the different benefits of all the different fungus. And, and it's, it's really, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, he's got... He's got his story when he, he used to stutter incredibly bad you know, all the way into his 20s and went through schools. And um, his big brother is what he turned him from Harvard, turned him on to psilocybin. And he was in Seattle and was on a real screaming, a real hard high. He ate way too much. <laughs> a heroic dose. Yeah. And went into a tree and went through a, a thunder lightning storm in a tree um, and fell asleep in the tree. And when he got off out of the tree the next morning, he wasn't stuttering anymore. No oh, shit. I have. I do not have any personal experiences with um, psychedelics. All I'll say is this: I have extraordinarily limited experience in psychedelics, and just the more and more research I read about it, it's like, mm, why is this illegal? Yeah. Well, why are we not funding clinics for this? Oh, yeah. that, oh, that's right, big pharma. Big pharma. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, same thing with hemp. Was yeah. Uh, um. The co uh, what was the name? It's uh, they were the cotton growers and the uh, Dupont. Okay, Dupont were the ones that made hemp. They actually named it marijuana. Okay, but before and hemp was legal. I think the Constitution is written on hemp paper. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like and Dupont got into the game because they were cotton growers back then, and they got hemp illegal. It was, and then they got well, cannabis as a Schedule Three. Uh, up there with heroin. And, it's a schedule one. Or schedule one. Yeah, schedule one. That's it. Schedule one. Schedule three. And that, I think hemp is at schedule three then. That would make sense because there's no, you don't use hemp. I mean, yeah, now people no, are using for CBD, but all that. But, yeah. But yeah. have you heard about what's happening now where CBD is being changed into Delta 9 THC? Delta 9's been around for a while. It's been a, a big arguing thing. Yeah. The Delta 8 and all that stuff? Yeah. yeah. But that's man-made. That's it, not naturally grown, correct? Th it is my understanding that what is happening is they're taking the CBD and then doing a chemical process. I don't know how it works specifically. I don't know the the, chemi the chemistry of it, but they are converting it over to Delta 9. Right. And they're they're sidestepping the law there yes. so that they can sell it. And we're dealing with those, with, with Arizona Normal, we're dealing with, hemp laws and all that regarding the legislation and, and um, uh, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The regulation of Delta 8. And especially at the, you know, there's things happening at the federal level because of the, the hemp bill and all that stuff. So yeah, because nobody knows how to deal with synthetic cannabinoids. 
uh, on the cannabis world. Yeah. So, and I don't understand the chemical synthesis that happens to, to, to I don't know. I, I know Can- about that. in Canada, they have synthesized it and they're using it quite a bit for, um, for the, uh, the psychological stuff. Okay. They've done psilocybin and I think they were able to do THC too. They're actually synthesizing THC and, now, of course, the street guys are buying the t- getting the THC, and then um, they were buying, getting hemp, which is super cheap for the flower, right. putting the, the liquid THC on it, and then selling it on the street for a fortune. And it's supposed to be just a scary freaking high. It's just an out of control buzz. Gotcha. Which, you know, and I, and I, you know, when I was, we were kids and we were doing it, we, you know, I, I could never even come close to handling the shit they got today. <laughs> the stuff that's out now is it's not just, the stuff of 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. And just to think, you know, we were stupid, young and stupid, um, still experimenting, but um, yeah, the stuff, today's kids, like you, you, the challenge with you and you're raising your young men. I can't. I mean, and I've got my nieces. I've got kids. They've got like five. Raising children in today's world is what a challenge, man. It's this stupid thing right here. Yeah. What a challenge. I mean, the drugs are a hundred times stronger. I mean, yeah. And then, oh, yeah, this crazy social media. Yep. Everything that's, uh, you know, what. And they're messing with their heads so bad, the doctrination. And I always thought it was. Uh, People that were wearing masks in schools. And hell, I remember when I was in elementary school, we used to hide under our desk because of a nuclear bomb right. drill. Like, what the hell is that going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when they come find us after the bomb's been right. dropped, we're going to have a bunch of little bodies under a melted desk. <laughs> you know, it's like, you guys think masks are bad. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what are we gonna do sitting under a desk yeah nothing it's just to make people feel better yeah well that's a good scare tactic too. oh amen and you know the gun thing too with uh you know they had people uh you know if there was a school or any, any kind of threat uh, i went to high school we all had guns in our trucks that's back in the day not anymore not nah, nah who didn't have a shotgun in the back of their truck i mean we did we shot 22s for target shooting but I mean, you could, you got somebody that's going to go into a gun into a school. Yep. Everybody's got guns. Yep. But we didn't have a shoot, school shootings. Well, and this is the conversation that people don't want to have. We straight off topic, obviously. Yeah. But, but this is the conversation people don't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about the fact of the mental health, which actually ties right back to health. And food. And food. A million percent. You bet. We can sit here and, and not talk about the fact of the antidepressants and the chemicals and all of that bullshit that people are pumping into their bodies instead of getting back to growing stuff, g- growing themselves, you know, actually, like you said, instead of consuming, start producing, start right. creating, start making something, start using this noggin up here and not just being a perpetual consumer. Right. Right. Oh, it's sugar. I mean, which is far, far, far more killer than anything else we've done out there. And the sugar people are, I mean, far stronger than tobacco. Yep. And the sugar people are safe. I mean, down to all the way down to, they have a thing called Mountain Dew Mouth. Have you, and it's in the Appalachians where the kids couldn't drink the water, so they drank pop. Oh, my God. And rots their teeth. I mean, that is just like... Yeah, sugar's a huge killer, and it, and it's 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 right along with poor health and diabetes, absolutely heart problems, overweight. Um, you know, like the I uh, it was somebody's kid. I mean, we used to shower in school. I mean, even in elementary school, we took showers okay. after PE. You know, nobody thought twice about getting naked in front of a bunch of other boys and right. shower because you went out and played football or you were sweating or. You know, and now the kids, they don't even have shower rooms. You know, I didn't sweat. I, why do I need to take a shower after PE? <laughs> you know, they don't even need to do PE anymore, probably. Right. I mean, we had the president's physical fitness test. Right, right, right. That, that was, was a big deal, man, to play in that. I mean, everybody was, that was super competitive to pass all the little things. Mm-hmm. Was that Kennedy? That implemented all that stuff, yeah. yes. Yeah, to get us healthy again. Yep. And then in the 80s, they brought in Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Reagan and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to get the kids moving and active again. Yeah. But it's like all of that has just fallen off by the wayside now. Now yeah. we, we have well, kids school, doing nothing. 
Well, the school indoctrination yep. is quite... I would homeschool if I had kids for sure. Where we live at here is fairly conservative. So they do have, they do still have trade schools and, and yeah. applied sciences and all that type of stuff, fortunately. So, and I have um, my 20 year olds out of school, obviously uh, my 10 year olds, very special needs. So this kind of doesn't apply to him, but my 16 year olds in the thick of it, my 16 year olds in the thick of it. He's a high school student. And again, it's like, he just tells me about all the strange stuff that's going on that he, and he talks about. And it's like, I, I don't have that experience, dude, because I, I led a pretty balanced life when I was in high school. Right. But it's just, they're just teaching shit that doesn't, he'll never use. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he'll yeah, never yeah, use. Yeah. yeah. You know, I hire young men. I'm trying to make a difference there. And some get it and some don't. And right. The ones that I find that really get it or have a work ethic are the 4 Hers yeah. that have done, the, you know, the sheep or the cow or whatever they did. But they understood how to care for an animal. Yeah how to work, how to clean up all the poop and get away from all that nonsense. And and then, I, you know, I bring them into the markets, like the, the Saturday market world. I've got 12-year-olds running a register. That, and I have 40-year-olds that can't run a register. They can't count money. Right. They can't make it work. I mean, they want, you know, somebody gives them a $50 bill and they want the machine to tell them how much right. change to give them. I, I, I won't lie to you that, you know, when I, I, this is something that stumped me, you know, like I forget, like they'll give you like a dollar and a penny right? and then you give them a dollar back. Like I'm so math deficient that I'm always like counting the change back. So, yeah. I, but, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah I mean, scared, spitless. And, yeah. and a lot of uh, businesses have gone to the card, no cash, which is horrible. <laughs> I mean, talk about tracking everything you spend yep. your money on and all the big brother thought, but then the other, just the, the you know, give me the card. And, right. And there's just, uh, to me, uh, but teaching young people how to count money, how to converse, being able to make mistakes. Yes. And not get embarrassed over it or, you know, and, and typically in a farmer's market, your consumer is, they're kind people. Mm -hmm. They are, they're there for kindness. They love the idea of a young person learning a responsibility so there's there's a room to make mistakes and they're not gonna make the kid feel horrible or whatever and um but i love that with those kids have a chance i think and then i because i hire them and at the high school they they call them the zombie squad and they go what's that and they're the kids on the fentanyl yeah they're just walking around like zombies I, and and they're not Nobody's doing anything about it. I went down to, I I uh, went down with a, an organization called the Masa Project. They feed the homeless down and f they, they do fentanyl walks and everything else just looking for that. And the number of, story, I did not, on the day that I went down with them and caught some video, um, there was not teenagers, but they tell me on the regular that they got 14, 15, 16 year olds kids that are down there living in homelessness and poverty uh, that are just addicted to fentanyl. Yeah. And it's just like, it, the, I know that Queen Creek High School's had um, an overdose in the last year and uh, another high school down here by us has. And again, it's just like it, what you said about earlier, we live in a society now where, and this is a quote from a buddy of mine that I had on here, is that I'm not scared of my son going to a party and getting hooked on drugs anymore. I'm scared of him going to a party and dying from one pill. You know, gone are the days of the experimentation. Like yeah. my, my son is great. He doesn't do anything like my 16 year old is great. He doesn't do anything like that. But you understand the jest. It's like, oh, yeah, it's It's too strong. It, everything is in the fentanyls and everything. Yeah. The fake pills, the fentanyl, the crisis. And then, you know, if you're a conspiracy think, you're a theorist, you're going to think this is some kind of a master plan. Oh, I, I agree with that. You know, this some, this has got a long range plan. On the, you know, the degradation of society. Well, and, and small farms are being criminalized. There's a, a recent story about a, a community farm that was completely shut down where the law enforcement went in to rip the their plans. And I'm former law enforcement, but fuck every cop that did that. Yeah. Bullshit. And they, and they replaced it with turf. Yeah. Yeah, they tore out the community gardens. This is something, and again, from, from meeting you and from meeting Patrick with the Soil King, so who introduced us, um, shout out. Patrick, but um, why is it that we live in a desert, okay, and there's golf courses and there's all of this bullshit all, all around us? Why isn't every tree planted by HOAs not a fruit tree? Yeah. Or a food-producing tree of some kind? So we'll waste the water 
for a pretty whatever. That's planting and zoning. You can only plant these species. Why? I think, well, number one, they don't want, they don't have anybody to pick up the fruit. And, and, and it's the sort of thing where you, you know this as well as I do. I'm not preaching to you, obviously. Like the fruit falls. What's it going to do? Yeah. It's going to grow another tree. So if we just let the, the natural ecosystem take care of itself, we would have free food everywhere. We would. And I, I'd thought about this. And we would, be feeding, uh, we would be feeding the poor. Everybody. Yeah. Walk down the road, pick up whatever. There was a church that where, where I, right next to where I used to go to school, and they would get pissed when we would pick the oranges and eat them on the way home. It's like, why? Yeah. And I get it. The stuff, the the food, the food that the fruit that drops will make a mess. Okay, I get that. I'd rather see old fruit on the ground, yeah, and grow another tree off in the dirt or something like that. Then, or even why did they even come up with the ornamental orange tree? Right. <laughs> why would you have an orange tree that you can't eat the fruit? Because they that just was, want the smell. That was man-made, yeah. and then the fruit rats came. And the rats would eat the fruit, and they would live in the houses, in your attics. I mean, Phoenix has got a horrible... The Arcadia District. Yeah. It's covered. Bottom. Yeah. It's covered in those those fruit trees. Right. My uncle lived in there when I was a kid. Yeah, just because of the... It, you can see it um, in architecture, too, which always freaked me out. And this is way back... I was up in Portland in the 70s. But architecture, where people would sit and sleep the bum or the homeless. And now you look at the architecture where they're putting in metal bars and balls and stupid stuff. Yeah. So you can't sleep there. No. You can't lay there. Yeah. I mean, they're taking, they're building that in and architecture in today's world is just horrible. It's just ugly boxes anyway, but um, look at our houses. Right. Oh my gosh. It's stucco. It's everything is the same. It's a chicken coop. Yeah. And that, you know, my, my, from my previous, job and all that my it's a where i am now in life my thought process on the homeless has completely changed and especially the fentanyl crisis that's happening you know i have a, a lot more compassion now and a lot more like we need to help people i don't know what the answer is yeah. i don't know what the solution is but again like why don't we have fruit trees why don't we have vines why don't we have you know all that types no we have to have this type of bullshit or like here in the you know when you go through the the southeast valley which is very pretty and pruned and you know it's got you gotta have immaculate this or that or the karen with the hoe is gonna find you or anything like that you go into the other places like in north scottsdale all of the shrubbery is natural indigenous habitat they're not planting shit but that's going to use water 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 yeah, zero scaping was another one of those crazy scams but well, like when I'm driving down the 202 and I see the big, all that open land, do you know how much food I could grow in there? Right. And there's already water there. Yep. There's already power there. Do you know how much food? You could feed thousands of people. Easily. And uh, we could do something like apple trees. Yeah. You know, it just, the waste of the state land is phenomenal. And all I want to do is put granite down. And then they spray it with uh, poison in the beginning. Of, they have two seasons for poison so they don't have any bushes or grasses growing there. And now the, over here off of uh, the 24, they sprayed in uh, yeah. all those flowers. Yeah. And that all comes right out of it. That's a pesticide with a flower seed. <laughs> so they get these pretty orange flowers in the spring, um, even though they're killing everything else around it. Our, but, I mean, just that one piece on the 24 from Ironwood to Ellsworth. Yeah we could feed a thousand people. And well, it, I would say more than that. That's a big traditional take, land. It wouldn't take a lot. I mean, tractors and dig it all up, compost it, put in your water system, your your green light went off. Oh, thank you. It's got to look pretty for the background. Yeah. But yeah, there's all of that, you know, and why not put those people to work? Oh, well, because we need them living off of the government. Yeah. I just, yeah, no, I just, that was, that really bothered me. It was about um, two months ago, driving down, coming home from, dropping my son off from school. I'm driving down this part of Gilbert and it's very pretty, very nice houses. Everything's pruned and manicured. It looks great. But I'm like, why is that tree there and not a an apple tree or a right. fig tree or a date tree or whatever? Like, I, yeah. It's crazy, isn't it's it? It's crazy. And you, well, we can 
for me, you know, I can have all those sleepless nights and worry about that shit, but it's, it's not worth it. You can only, you're only control of what you're in control of. Build what you can do, make the changes that you can grassroots community based, you know, be kind, which is totally unheard of. Right. In social media. You know, I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. You know, I don't care if you're gay. Everybody eats. Yep. We all got to eat. What I do care is that, you know, do take care of yourself. Do the best you can. I've been overweight my entire life. I fought it for I'm, my entire life. And I'm, you know, I'm in my mid-60s. So, you know, all my buddies are, you know, they're having stints put in yeah. and hips replaced and, you know, all kinds of major, major stuff. Luckily, I haven't had that. I've been sick a couple of times, but I, you know, I deal with gout, which is, and it's a, it's something that I can avoid, or at least I'm, they've told me I can avoid because of my diet. Yeah. But I haven't been able to s- isolate the trigger foods and it's in my history. We're Sicilian. So, you know, I'm going to eat my cheeses. That's why we get along so well. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm Sicilian you know, as well. I, I broke, you know, I used to, I love beer, especially the local beers. We have some phenomenally great brewers here. Amen. And I and I can't drink beer anymore because of the uh, you know what I can't. Do I drink beer or walk? Right. It, those are the choices I have to make. And I'm a farmer, so I've got to be able to move around. You know, lately I've been straddled onto a computer trying to make sure make things work, but nobody wants that job. At least in my world, we all want to be out playing in the soil. We all want to be planting, harvesting, fighting the bugs, you know, chasing the gophers. That's that's where life is happening. And that's why I call that my little slice of heaven. It's a sanctuary. And that's the place. That's the way it's going to stay as long as I'm here. Now the guy behind me is going to get the benefit of all. We yeah. put in the 400 fruit trees. So he's going to have a lot of benefits coming to him unless they tear it all out and put in a couple of houses. You know, we won't have any choice then, but... Our, our area or, our, you know, our land has to be our sanctuary. It has to be. And I don't want to go travel somewhere. I just want to stay at the farm. Because I can, a Sunday afternoon, I can walk out there with a book, my dogs, and just sit in the middle of the field, have the ants bite me, and read. And love every minute of it. Build a life you don't need to run away from. Yeah. Yeah. We've been going at this for two and a half hours. Okay. And there's so much more I want to talk to you about. And it's the sort of thing where I have, I have the benefit of knowing you and going to your farm and just talking to you and learning from you. Where are some places that people could go who are sitting in their homes and listening to this that can get some information and learn? Um, there, what I think you should do is I think you should start doing a weekly series. I should. Where I come out and we it, talk about this once a week. I'll, That's just a little suggestion on my part. I'll but. make that deal with you if you help me build that process. Amen. I'll, so I'm that there. I can, I can't, I don't have the time to build it, start it. If I had the equipment, a little bit of forethought, and what I could do and make that deal with you is every week, we're dealing with a different issue and then just share with you the week. Let's do it. Um, and that, and as the seasons go, as the markets go, the silliness of, you know, like um, I got at Gilbert, uh, at the Gilbert market, which is the only market I'm at now because it's, uh, you know, it's only a grower's market. Gotcha. There's 59. We could, I could spend four hours with you on fake farmers that are allowed in farmer's markets okay. in the Valley. There's, 58, 59 farmers markets, but there's only one that is a processor only. So I, I could go to downtown Phoenix and go all over and I'm fighting the phony farmers that are actually buying food from a distributor, Costco, putting it in their box, selling it under their name and the consumer is not the wiser. The farmers all know who they are because they got fucking watermelons in May. <laughs> you can't tell, I can't tell you how many people yell at me. You, why are your watermelons? And you go, do you have any idea what it takes to grow a watermelon? No, they don't. Not a clue. I said 88 days. They give me their wrinkled eye. Okay. 
88 days. Let's go backwards, 88 days. What month is it? This is May. That's December. Yeah. How much sunlight do you have in December to grow a watermelon? <laughs> you got to be on the other side of the frickin' equator. Yeah. But it's organic. Oh, I don't care. If you really understood what more organics is, it's got a lot of... Once it went political, it just went to shit. The original guy that did organic certification, who they booted out a long time ago, that was a solid plan. Okay. Solid plan. And then it went political. And now it's like, I tell you, it's a tax. And you go down to Nogales to talk to those guys. I mean, the food going on through Nogales is unbelievable. California, is, the amount of food California puts out is astronomical. But it's gone to politics. Gotcha. They call it a marketing program. Because they know the same guys that are selling conventional are also selling organic. Mm. It's coming out of the same freaking field. You think there's a whole bunch of organic certifying agencies that actually go into the depth of Mexico to walk the farms? Absolutely not. They all say they do, but who has the proof? Right. Show me the data. That's another thing I'd love to get into the, do the discussion is nutrient density. We can't even decide what is good, what nutrients are necessary in broccoli. Everybody fights over what's good, what's bad, what's this, what's that. And that's why our all our nutritional facts on our boxes are so old because nobody can say what's good and what's bad. And now that we're understanding more and more about um, nobody can say this system, this is how we're going to do it. Okay. I, in my mind, it's going to be a 10 point system. You know, you got five, you got zero to negative five and zero to positive five. Number one, no advertising for anything under a zero. Okay. So all sugar products are gone. Coca-Cola, they're out. No advertising. Nothing. You need even organic. And you have to have new, you have to have tissue testing. California's making a big stride right now for nitrogen because it's a it's killing their oceans because the farmers are putting on so much nitrogen, it's not being uptake by the plants. Gotcha. It's just washing down the streams. And then it blows up. Look at the Gulf of Mexico uh, off the Mississippi River. That green algae slime yeah yeah nothing can live in it and that's coming that comes from all the way up the river a thousand miles away from the guys spraying their fields up there with all chemicals and poison and then we eat it and then we eat it it doesn't break down it doesn't do shit so yeah back to our other deal on a weekly i would love to do something like that where, where we can share i can share with you how my week went um what i'm reading what rabbit hole i'm playing in um, you know, right now we're doing massive, uh, well, the beehive, we could spend hours talking about bees and I could point you at a couple of books. They'll totally blow your shit away. Do you remember the Borg? Yeah. 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 That's a beehive. Okay. That's how the writer created the Borg. No shit. Yeah. Okay. From the collective mind. The collective mind. It's a super being. We, people are so afraid. I love bees. But everybody, you know, we don't want to kill bees, but bees don't last a long time. No, not at all. They have 40 days for the worker bees. Beehives grow and shrink by the amount of food that's available to them. And their society is unbelievable, how they protect themselves. There's a, a, a beehive out called the flow hive, which is, to me, it's, it's man, greed, 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 greed. And it shows you pretty pictures of a tap. Off your beehive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah I know what you're talking about. If you've ever been around a beehive and open honey, you're you're dead. I mean, they're bee. That's their food. Yeah, yeah. They're going to be all over it. So they smoked all the bees out of there. And then you get into how bees communicate. It's called the waggle dance. And they actually communicate through their comb. And it's a vibration in the way they dance with their legs. And that's how they tell the other bees where all the really good food is. Okay. So, and then they work off of the sun. So where the difference between a bumblebee and a honeybee, bumblebees are all vision. Honeybees are, are set geocentrical by the sun. So you can't move a beehive, an established hive, you move it three feet or three miles. But as soon as you move it, it's gonna they're gonna swarm. And the, what they're doing in the swarm, they're geosyncing. Okay. Because they're in a whole new neighborhood. You move it six feet, they'll leave. No they're kidding. Gone split 
I mean, it's a super being, so we can't say that we're if all the bees are dead, that true, we'll starve to death. Right. But really, more importantly, is the ants. If we lost all the ants, we'd be long gone. But there'll always be, if there's one queen left, she can repopulate the entire world. Wow. Because they grow. They're super beings. It's a super... And to read and think and get yourself through that whole process, why they ha they have you know they have more workers, more everybody by the food, why they move, why the new queens come, how the old queens go, their whole way of thinking is propagation and food. Okay, so we steal their food. Now, granted, your hive can get so old, they run out of room. Okay, and they split because they can't. Even though it's full of honey, they can't grow. The hive always has to grow. And that's why they they swarm. In springtime right now, we'll get all kinds of swarms. And people will have a swarm you know, on their backyard, on a tree, or on a diving board, or something silly. And they totally freak out. Right. And all you got to do is wait till the next day, and they're gone. Because the queen is resting. I did have a, a in one of my pop-outs in the front of my house. Oh, yeah. We, we went to uh, uh, get on a trip years ago. And came back a few days later, and I had a huge hive that was in four days. I yeah, had, did, but they didn't have enough time to build the hive. It was just a swarm. Yeah, it, but there was there like seven, combs and all that uh, type of stuff. Shit, in there. They are working fast. Yeah, yeah they yeah. were working really fast. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I, I told my wife that I wanted a beehive, and she was like, nope, that's the one thing she said no to. Yeah. Yeah, but that's this. Well, I, one of the, th the things we can talk about, and since we're building a new hive, now and I've got my my girl. She, I put her to school, that works for me. She's a she's a sweet kid, and she's one of the, she's really open, and I love that. And like Zach, one of my other workers, who's really into mushrooms. So, I love to empower these people. Husto, the manager. I mean, he has the touch, so I give him what he needs to explain that. And that place is ninety percent Husto. Gotcha. That's not me. That's him. Because, I mean, I have to yell at him for wearing, not wearing shoes. Because that's just the way he grew up. Yeah, yeah. But his vision, and, you know, we, we argue over it all. I want this plan, I want this, and then, no, I can't do that. We're not going to do that. Yeah, we are going to. And then <laughs> I'm at the market, and I go, and somebody brings me something. And I go, you know, I, I'm so embarrassed, I can't even tell you what the hell that is. It looks like mustard to me. And it's rue. And I go, I know we didn't buy any rue seed. What the hell's rue? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I, I'll yell at Husto, what's rue? And he goes, that's an herb. It comes out of Mexico, blah, 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 blah. Great. Thanks, dude. But yeah, this I, uh, my people that work for me, I've got a really strong team. When I got sick um, over Christmas, I was out for three weeks. We didn't miss a delivery. Nice. We didn't miss a build or a, an invoice. They all came together and filled my shoes. And let me heal. You built a community. Yeah. And all of the people that kept buying. That's what I, you know, when you establish yourself at a market, as long as you can stay consistent, you're home free. I mean, they'll, you'll always, and there's a lot that goes into a market that most people don't know. You know, not only do you have to get your ass out of bed, <laughs> um, but taking it, the distribution, and Gilbert Market's really strict. Like, they wouldn't let me, they stopped me from doing my CBD products. Interesting. They stopped me from doing my pills, anything that I was doing aftermarket. Okay. Jams, jellies, couldn't do any of that any longer. Processed stuff? Processed stuff. Gotcha. That I was doing at the farm. A town of Gilbert wants to uh, treat me like a food truck. Mm. And then they would charge tax. Mm. And then I would have, because there is no food tax in Arizona. So, um, if but there are other states that have taxes okay. on food, so if you're buying like you could buy a you can buy a frozen burrito that has no tax, but if you cook the burrito in the store, now it's taxed. Interesting. In the wild. Who the hell thought of that? A politician. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a politician that wanted to fund their deep pockets. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the process, and uh, then you know there's all the silly laws about what you can and can't do in your own backyard. Yep. Um, you know, you can't kill a chicken. Yep. You can have hens, but you can't have a rooster. Right. <laughs> Who thought of that? <laughs> now, 
uh, having young children, I'm kind of happy that there's not a rooster, you know, cock a doodle doodling at five o'clock in the morning. But but I hear you. I, 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 I think you. that's more me and my farm living, where I I can tell what's going on outside by the birds. Right, right, right. Especially if there's coyotes in the hood. But you got somebody squawking in the middle of the night, you got trouble. Right. That's yeah. a warning signal to everybody else. There's something up. I'm I'm all about. But, uh, going you know, back to this lifestyle yeah. and getting getting back to what's important. Having a, a concrete truck drive down the street at 2 o'clock in the morning, that'll wake my ass right up. But right? a rooster won't. <laughs> Unless it's, it's and even with, I have guardian dogs. And we can do a whole session on the dogs and how they communicate, how their barks mean different yeah. barks and how, the, when, how they alert each other. You know, I've got the one old shepherd and then I've got the two... Uh, uh, great Pyrenees okay. and, and how they communicate, you know, it's a brother sister team, but you know, and if they're in the house and they're out all night, supposedly, but they, they come into the house if it's raining or whatever. But if it's the girl and she's out and the boys upstairs on one of the beds, if she puts out a certain tone, man, he's rumbling and the shepherd will come out too, to go after the coyotes or whatever's going on and uh, barking away and the neighbor's dogs and, even donkeys and mules are great alarm animals. They're guardian animals that live, and they just have this natural protection. All of this stuff was given to us. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. Good for you. And and I believe that this stuff was given to us by God yeah. to be used. And again, like we just, humans just get in the way and fuck it all up. They do. Absolutely. And what I... We can, anybody can do what I do. Anybody. I'm nothing special, over-intelligent. I disagree, but. Yeah. Anybody can grow food, even in Arizona, and I can show you how to do it. You just got to have the drive, the passion, and then the labor piece. Right. Which is a discipline. The laborers, we are fat and happy and easygoing. It's easier to just run in my kitchen and grab something packaged and then rip yep. it open yep. than sit there and wait for my tomato to grow. Yep. And tomatoes are artwork. None of this fucking tennis ball shit that we eat today comes out of the grocery. Tomatoes are pure artwork. You know, just like Pat and it's his cannabis world. Those guys are artists. Too. Agreed. They are. Oh, agreed. Yeah. That, that thinking, that drive... You know, that's not just for the high. No, not they at all. Are, they are out there. They are putting together. And I know people in the floral industry that are that same way, you know, that are doing uh, flowers that have to have that constant color, that breeding, all of that put together to make the best flower. And like I said, arguing with the lady about the eggs, an $8 dozen eggs, but I can sell her a $20 pot of flowers, right? which cost me 40 cents. <laughs> But over the eggs, it cost me six fifty to you know to get that dozen out the door. I'm making a buck off the dozen. I'll just sell you the flowers, right? But and there's no food safety on flowers and other. I mean, there's a whole different way of thinking. You put the food and the politics into the safety piece. You know, there's where your prices and then the middlemen that are involved and the other piece, transportation. I don't know a farmer that is good at logistics. You don't want to be. Yeah, you, you don't want to be. I don't have enough time. Yeah, <laughs> you want to grow shit. I want to grow shit. Yeah. Let me do what I do good, you know, and then somebody else do the logistics. Yeah, I get it. Especially with refrigeration. If you had any idea how much money I spent on fixing refrigeration, <sighs> but that will be one of our discussions. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, like how I insulate, you know, our walk-in coolers. Yeah. What temperatures you you keep stuff at? Yeah. If you're being inspected, you don't have to have. 24 degree coolers. You you know, if you're if you're cooling for your home and you're putting your walk in or something in your backyard, just think of uh your grandparents with the or their old uh the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I pantry. know some of the yeah, cellars yeah. and all that. Yeah, 50 degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Degrees. yeah. You can keep so much food forever at 55 degrees. Your potatoes, your squash. I'm gonna go dig a hole. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Or build something, yeah. build a little igloo. Uh, you always want the pantry, and that's another thing, food storage. Yeah. I mean, we've got our canning classes coming up. Uh, everybody should know how to can food. 
That would be a great special too. Bosh, botulism, you know, and all that big fear. Right. And it, can you grow enough food to can? Sure you can. You know, you can grow enough peaches. One tree will feed a family if you can it. Because you're getting all that fruit at once. And eat you just got to keep can. it. Yeah, eat what you can fresh. Yeah. Preserve the rest. I don't care if you're canning, drying, drying, smoking, smoking, fermenting. Another super healthy thing. I was going to say, which is great for your gut back, gut flora. Yep. So, where can people find you? I am in Santan Valley. <laughs> you can find me on the internet. RogueRhino.club is the now the uh, the Riba Farms is the commercial side of the business. So okay. I can tell you how I had to make that change a few years ago or actually just this last year um, but that would be for another discussion that involves insurance companies and actually having my business shadow banned um, by different companies that wanted to charge me more money for doing stuff which is ludicrous um, and that's why I drove or, or created the new private membership gotcha. which is Rogue Rhino which is Rogue Rhino yeah um, also, we're in schools. Um, I'm at Tempe School District. I teach there. Maricopa at MCC. I teach there every now and then. But yeah, internet would be, if you go to ribafarms.com. R-H-I-B-A yeah, farms. That's just a cover page and gotcha. a phone number. So really, the best way to find me is just to come out to the farm. There you go. Saturdays only. A lot of people don't like that idea, but. Again, it's me and five people. You run a farm. I run a farm. It's your business. Yeah, and I don't have time to chit chat. Right, right. Um, I Saturdays is chit chat day. That's if you want to come learn, come Saturdays. Come to the market at the farm. If you have children, please attend the children. I'm very. I don't want wild and crazy and right. insanity running through and throwing rocks at the ducks or any of that stuff. I love teaching children um, because most of them don't even know what a carrot looks like right. in the ground. Not anymore. Most, most adults don't even know what a carrot looks like. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just learning how nature will treat you. And and we do, I demand that the property is treated like a sanctuary. We take care of it. It takes care of us. You put in 50%, it gives you back 110. And for people who are like, God, that's kind of mean. No, no, no. When you go there and you step foot on this place, it's like stepping into, you forget you're in Arizona. You, you don't even realize, like, again, I said it in the beginning, it, it feels like Hawaii. It's just yeah. gorgeous. It's just I hear beautiful. that a hundred times. It's amazing. I, yeah. And I told you before, I said at the beginning, like, that was the first place I wanted to go when I could get my ass up and out yeah. of the house. Because it just, it just, like, the energy just felt so good. This is like when the first time Pat walked on there, he just freaked. And I, I met him at the market. He found me, but most people find me. I don't find them. Gotcha. And then we just hold on to them. And if you can befriend a farmer, and there's some great small farmers in this valley, great ones, and they're close to you, you know, make friends with them. Yeah. You know, and for us, the only way I make that kind of money is trust. They see how we do it. They trust me or my people, and they'll pay more to just for that trust. And then the flavor. That is something that's just, you cannot just, compare. Nah, you cannot close. compare. I mean, even our chickens. You'll freak if you eat one of them. I haven't had one of the chickens yet. I'll have to get one of those. Totally freak. So. I, when I had, I was just like, <gasps> I, just wild. It's not that neutral, dead meat. Right. It's flavorful. Turkeys are the same way. And we don't grow big chickens or big turkeys. We, it's all heritage stuff. So You're not pumping them full of? No crap to make no, them three times the size feed and and that's another thing it, yeah, i have the discussion with meat eaters and i you know i've gone back and forth um with if you don't know what your animal that you're eating is eating you're gambling you shouldn't be eating it yeah and if it's different though if you're in a forest because you know it's, there are deer that are going to have diseases and then but most of the time you're cleaning the animals mm -hmm. so you're going to see mm -hmm. problems in the organs buying hamburger today that comes from 14 different locations and probably a, over a hundred different cows yeah. from brazil you have no clue and it has pink slime in it you have no clue so mark thank you so much this is to be continued yes we're going to call this episode one 
Okay. We're going to call this episode one because we're going right. to do follow-ups. Yep. Yeah, we've been going at this for almost three hours. Shit. I'm in trouble. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, man. This has been fantastic. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for having me. To be continued, everyone. Stay tuned. This is the beginning of something. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. All right, brother.